Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Andrew Hagger. Mr Hagger in the room? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Hagger, would you come into the witness box, please? And if you'd be good enough to remain standing, Mr Hagger, I excused you further attendance last time, so I think I should uh, ask you to take the oath again. Sure. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Haggard. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Um, uh, is your full name Andrew Paul Hagger? Uh, yes. And is your business address 700 Burke Street, Melbourne, Victoria? Yes. And you are currently the Chief Customer Officer, Consumer Banking and Wealth at the National Australia Bank? Yes. Uh, in your role as Chief Customer Officer, you report to the Group CEO? Yes. And you appoint, were appointed to that role in August 2016? Uh, yes, I was. Are you able briefly, Mr Hagger, uh, to identify your main responsibilities as Chief Customer Officer? Uh, as Chief Customer Officer, I have accountability over uh, the retail bank, so that's uh, branches uh, around Australia. Um, the mortgage broking uh, area, so our uh, engagement with uh, mortgage uh, brokers, um, all uh, NAB's uh, contact centres, call centres um, that, that uh, take millions of calls per year, um, the financial uh, advice uh, area, and uh, overall um, NAB's uh, workings then for uh, six, approximately six million uh, retail customers. Thank you, Mr Hagar. In your role as Chief Customer Officer, are you responsible for NAB's superannuation business? Uh, no, I'm not. Thank you. Now, from April 2013 to July 2016, you were Group Executive NAB Wealth? Yes. And in that role, did you have management responsibility for NAB's superannuation business? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, now, prior to that, from October 2011 to March 2013, you were the Group Executive of People, Marketing and Communications? Yes. And from October 2010, you have been a member of NAB's Executive Leadership Team? Yes. Um, you're also a Director, Mr Hagger, of National Wealth Management Services Limited? Yes. Uh, and can I ask this, notwithstanding your lack of responsibility for NAB's superannuation business in your role as Chief Customer Officer, did you retain any responsibilities with respect to planned service fees after August 2016? Uh, yes. And what was the nature of that responsibility, Mr Hagger? Uh, well, we had the changeover of responsibilities as of the 1st of August amongst the, oh, sorry, amongst the executive leadership team inside our NAB. And uh, in relation to, there were two events in relation to planned uh, service fees involving uh, non-linked uh, advisors and uh, one related to uh, TERP and the other one related to SWIFT and Encompass. And I um, agreed with Anthony Carhill, who was the uh, group executive newly taking responsibility for superannuation, um, that I would uh, carry forward those two matters um, because they were still under review and in discussions with ASIC, which I had already uh, begun. Thank you. And just to clarify, those two events are the events notified to ASIC on the 24th of December 2015 and the yes. 14th of September 2016? Yes. Thank you. Now, on Friday, the 10th of August, you received a summons to appear before the Commission? Yes. Uh, do you have the original of that summons with you? Uh, yes, I do. I tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.145, summons to Mr Hagger. And finally, Mr Hagger, have you received a request to provide a written statement for this round of the Commission's hearings? Uh, no, I haven't. Thank you. No further questions, Commissioner. Yes. Yes, Mr Hart. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Hagger, the Commission is hoping that you can assist it with a couple of matters. And the first concerns the dealings that you had with ASIC in October of 2016. So. To help you put this in context, we might just have a look at some documents. Can we bring up NAB.047.007.5.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.
Mr Hodge, is it possible for me to have any hard copies? If, if I can't, I'll obviously use the screen, but it would be easier for me to help if I had a hard copy, if they're available. I'm in you, the Commission's hands. We will uh, have copies of almost all of the documents that have been put to Mr Hager, and if it would assist him and the Commission, I would hope to hand copies to Your Honours. Uh, they can be handed to the Associate. And, thank you. Uh, uh, according to the course of the examination, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hager may have access to them. But Grateful they to can be provided you, to uh, uh, the associate, please. Thank you, Commission. Hey, Mr. Hager, this is a chain of emails where you'll see at the bottom of the first page there is an email from Ms Debenham to a number of people, including you, sent on the 26th of September 2016. Yes. And then at the top of the page is an email sent on the 19th of October 2016 by Ms Debenham to a number of people, including you. Yes. And you'll see the email on the 19th of October 2016, begins by explaining that ASIC is about to release its report on incorrect charging of advisor service fees. Yes. Can I ask, have you reviewed this document over the course of the weekend, in the course of preparing? Uh, the yes, I, I, looked at, I looked at a lot of documents over the weekend, Mr Hodge, but included this one. Thank you. And you'll see that the issue that Ms Debenham is raising is how the details in relation to PSF events are to be communicated to ASIC? Uh, yes, I, th I think what she's raising here, Mr Hodge, is that uh, we you know, knew ASIC was doing a report on ASFs, um, but I think by the time she wrote this um, email, she was saying she had now had confirmation from ASIC that the ASF report would definitely disclose details of the TERP PSF breach. That's right. It's going to deal with the TERP PSF breach and it's unclear whether or not it will deal with the SWIFT and Encompass PSF Correct. events. Yes. And the TERP PSF breach was the breach that was notified to ASIC on the 24th of December 2015? Yes, it was and the SWIFT and Encompass PSF events were notified to ASIC on the 14th of September 2016. Uh, they were breach notified then. They were raised with ASIC prior to that. You'd previously, you personally had previously told ASIC that you were investigating the yes. issue in relation to SWIFT and Encompass. Yes. And then the breach notifications were given on the 14th of September 2016. Correct. And the issue that she is specifically raising, and we can see this about halfway through the email with the word specifically, is specifically I'd like to get agreement and instruction on whether we intend to preemptively communicate about, and there's four bullet points. Yes. And one is TERP PSF event and associated remediation. Yes. Or all PSF events and associated remediation. Yes. Or Project Rio in total. Yes. Or none of the above. Yes. And could you just explain to the Commissioner what Project Rio was? Uh, Project Rio uh, was uh, that in, uh, I think about June 2016, Mr Hodge, ASIC uh, had indicated to us that they wished to pursue either an enforceable undertaking or licence conditions uh, in relation to a number of matters. I think that's been the subject of discussions previously in this uh, round. And uh, so Project Rio was the work that was pulling together the assurance review and other uh, matters around that. And at that time, of course, we were uh, still in discussions with ASIC about those matters, but we uh, didn't know whether I think what was being discussed here was whether to preemptively communicate um, to, you know, by way of media release or whatever, um, that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, licence conditions, et cetera, were being discussed, but they hadn't yet been finalised. You hadn't, ASIC had given, indicated that its preference was for an enforceable undertaking? Well, by this day, at, at the beginning, they had said, 
that they were uh, uh, satisfied either with an enforceable undertaking or licence conditions. I think by the time of this email, um, the, it had come down to licence conditions. They had said that they would prefer an enforceable underta undertaking at the beginning, hadn't they? Uh, I, I th it would be good to go to the doc. I can't remember the exact uh, wording, Mr Hodge, but w what I recall was um, they said that they felt something was appropriate. They wrote a fair bit about enforceable undertaking and the steps involved and said we would also be satisfied if it was licence conditions. I think, I think that's been discussed. NAB's preference was for licence conditions. Uh, well, ultimately, both uh, enforceable uh, undertaking and uh, licence conditions were discussed, and ultimately, the uh, and both had their uh, advantages and disadvantages. But ultimately, the um, uh, proposed approach was uh, that the the agreed approach was licence conditions. NAB's preference was for licence conditions. I think NAB was open to both, depending on discussions with the trustee. Um, as, as I recall it, um, as, as I recall it, uh, NAB's preference, well, there, there were differing views actually, um, but, but ultimately the uh, trustee preferred licence conditions and I think uh, for NAB that that was a good outcome too. NAB Wealth preferred licence conditions. Um, yes, I'm just trying to recall the You're not sure. sequence of it. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I know that we were satisfied at the end that licence conditions was, um, was appropriate. Do you recall that the view was that licence conditions would be less likely to attract adverse publicity than an enforceable undertaking? Uh, I think that was one of the factors, yes. Now then, you see the second last paragraph says, to be clear, I'm not necessarily proposing that we should communicate preemptively. Rather, I wanted to flag that if we go down that path, I'll need to engage ASIC as soon as possible. Whichever way it falls, we might need to consider how this lines up with EOY results announcements. That's right. And that's end of year results announcements. Yes. And that's because NAB was about to announce its full year results for yes. the financial year that had just concluded. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails between Devonham, Hagger and others, 26 September and 19 October 16, uh, NAB 0470007 Emails entitled ASIC, ASF, PSF reporting, Exhibit 5.146. Now then, you... then had an exchange of emails on the 19th of October with Mr Brown, and I'll bring that up. Can we bring up nab.047.001.2628? So you see, this is a chain of emails on the 19th of October, later in the day. Yes. And you see it forwards at the bottom of the page, a lengthier email, for, oh, another email from Ms. Debenham. Yes. And you're forwarding it to Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Brown was the EGM for Investor Relations. Yes. And you were saying to Mr. Brown, I'll brief you tomorrow about this issue. Yes. And again, did you review this document in the course of preparing to give evidence today? Uh, I saw it uh, briefly last night, yes. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, emails of 19 October. Uh, 
16, Hagger and Brown concerning ASIC advice service fee report NAB 047-001-2628, exhibit 5.147. And then can we bring up NAB.162.017.2128? This is already exhibit 5.30. Now the email at the top of the page is, or the two emails at the top of the page are not emails that you are on, but you see about a third of the way down the page, an email begins from Mr. Owens. Yes. And that's sent on the morning of the 20th of October, 2016. Yes. Mr. Owens is from Corporate Affairs. Yes. You see the email is sent to you. Yes. And Mr. Owens is making a recommendation which is that there be open and transparent dealings with customers, stakeholders and ASIC. Yes. And in particular, his recommendation is to reveal that the estimate now for remediation is in the order of $34 million. Sorry, can you repeat that question, Mr Hodge? In particular, yes. his recommendation is to reveal the total remediation amount that is estimated. Sorry, I'm just... Perhaps I need to read the whole document. I'm just reading that he assumed um, that NWMSL and the trustees would accept management's recommendation. Sorry, can you just show me the, where he recommends? Yes. Did you review this document in the course of preparing to give evidence today, Mr Hodge? Uh, I'm not sure whether I did. All right. If you look, you see option one, three quarters of the way down the page. Yes. Our preferred option would see NAB proactively announce all aspects of the PSF issue, including customer numbers and the total remediation amount. Corporate Affairs also recommends that we should flag our intention to conduct an assurance review. Yes, I see that. And you understood that that would involve revealing to ASIC the full amount of remediation that was estimated? Uh, yes, that would. And it would involve revealing to the public the full amount of remediation that was expected? Under that approach, yes. And you see Mr Owens also says, slightly up the page, NWMSL and the trustees, I'm sorry, it says we have assumed MWMSL and the trustees will accept management's recommendation to remediate in full the TERP Encompass and SWIFT events with yes. approximately $34 million in remediation provided to 220,000 members. Yes. And you were aware at this time, that is on the 20th of October 2016, that this was the recommendation of management? Of... Uh in WMSL on the 20th, uh, I'm not sure, Mr Hodge. You think the first time you found out that management was going to make this recommendation was when Corporate Affairs sent you an email on the 20th? Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that, Mr Hodge. I'm just trying to uh, uh, recall the sequencing. Um, the decision as to what recommendation was going to be made was a decision yes. made in consultation with you? Yes, yes. No, I'm, I'm, I fully understand that, Mr Hodge. I'm just, this is, I'm just trying to get in my mind. This is the Thursday, the 20th of October. Yes. And the NWMSL board was meeting the following week. On Monday. On Monday. Yes. That's correct. And I, so I'm, I'm just not sure of the juxtaposition of, of, um, uh, of that, but I, um, but the, the board paper, I don't know, I can't remember when the board papers went out for NWMSL, but I was aware somewhere over those, I, I don't, maybe I'm trying to get pedantic about it, a day here or a day there, because there were uh, some shifts occurring during that week. But, um, you know, as, as you know, we, 
um, uh, agreed to uh, remedia in full. I just can't remember whether I knew that on the Thursday or, or, or before that we were taking that to the NWMSL board. The decision as to what was to be taken to the NWMSL board Yes. It was a decision that you would have approved before it was taken. Yes. yes. Sorry, Mr. Hodger. Is that right? Please, please understand. I'm not in any way questioning any of that. I'm just trying to remember time-wise when I, I had uh, when I had done that. I, I just want to make sure that we are agreeing about this: that whatever recommendation it was that management had settled on, it was a recommendation that would have been done with your agreement. The recommendation to the NWMSL board. Yes. That's right. Yes. And so. If Mr Owens knows on the 20th of October 2016 what the recommendation is going to be, it must be the case that you would have already known what the recommendation would be. That, I, that's probably right, Mr Hodge. Because you would have approved it before it was made. Um, yes, he, I, I understand what you're saying. I just can't remember the precise sequencing of that week, Mr Hodge. That's, I'm, I'm sorry that that's coming across in a... Uh, in, in a disjointed way, but during the course of that week, uh, it is uh, true that I uh, approved a recommendation to the NWMSL uh, board. I just can't remember the sequence of which days which are uh, there. Now then, on the 21st of October, the next day, ASIC provided a draft of the report to NAB. I can bring up that document if it would help. Can we bring up nab.158.006.5028? That is also commissioner already an exhibit, along with its attachment. So the email is exhibit 5.31 and its attachment, which we'll look at in a moment, is exhibit 5.32. So you can see Mr Hagger on the bottom of the screen, an email from Ms McCauley of ASIC emailing to Ms Hopwood and Ms Debenham of NAB a copy of the draft report. Yes. And then if we bring up the attachment, which is exhibit 5.32 and which is nab.158.006.5030. Thank you. Oh, sorry, one to another. I think they're bringing over a copy of the draft report to you now, Mr Hager. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the draft report. And if you go to page 24 of that draft report, which is dot 5053. Yes. You'll see there table four, estimated further compensation as reported to ASIC as at 31 August 2016. Yes. Now, do you know how the $11.7 million came about? Uh, yes, that, uh, well, that, that relates to the TERP uh, PSF uh, event matter. That was the most recent estimate that had been given by NAB to ASIC about the full amount of remediation for TERP. Um, I, I'm not sure, it, it would, because I, I can't remember whether we uh, gave them uh, the any updated number to that, but that that's the number that ASIC obviously had at the time that they were sending to us saying is that the the right number as at 31 August. But the number would have come from NAB in the first place, yes. And whose responsibility is it within the NAB group to update ASIC as to the amount estimated for remediation? where that remediation is going to be paid by the trustee? Oh, well, typically uh, the communication with ASIC occurs either through uh, regulatory affairs, well, particularly through regulatory affairs, and from time to time when there's, when, when we're not talking estimates, but there's, you know, a, a particular paper going forward, it will, if it's the trustee, be signed by the trustee. Does regulatory affairs sit within NAB Wealth or within the entire NAB group? It doesn't sit inside NAB Wealth. It sits inside the risk, the independent risk function of NAB. When a breach notification is given on behalf of the trustee to yes. ASIC, yes. who makes the determination as to whether there is a significant breach? Uh, I'm, 
I'm not on the breach review committee for the trustee, um, so I'm, I'm not sure who makes that uh, decision, but it's not, not anything I'm involved with. Do you know that the trustee doesn't have its own breach committee? Uh, I, I believe what happens is there is a breach review committee which the office of the trustee uh, is on and the breach review committee of uh, wealth is chaired by Damien Murphy who's the CRO or the chief risk officer uh, for wealth and the chief risk officer for the trustee. We just take that in steps. Sure. There's a breach review committee within NAB wealth? No. The breach review committee. Breach review committee for NAB wealth? Yes. And a representative of the office of trustee sits on that committee? Yes, I believe so. And that committee makes the determination as to whether there is a significant breach for the trustee? Uh, I, I believe, well, I, I know how it works for, uh, fr from a management perspective, I'm not sure what ha exactly how it works for the trustee, Mr Hodge. How does it work from a management perspective? The breach review committee meets and, the, uh, and if the breach review committee decides that there is a significant breach, then a breach notice is uh, then um, prepared and uh, sent to ASIC. So the decision is being made by the Breach Review Committee to answer your question squarely. And signed by the Chief Risk Officer? Yes, as Chair of the Breach Review Committee. And then subsequently there'll be a notification given to the Board of the Trustee that this has occurred? Well, in relation to the Trustee, what I'm not sure, Mr Hodge, from my perspective, you don't I'm know not involved with it. I don't know whether there's something uh, additional around the Trustee our process. I understand. And when there are updates then given to ASIC, yes. those updates are done by whom, do you think? Oh, well, there's both formal and informal updates to ASIC from time to time. So typically updates um, will be uh, through the regulatory affairs uh, unit and uh, it's really to them that the working team inside uh, ASIC often reaches out. So there'll be things initiated inside um, the, the NAB group from time to time and there'll be times that ASIC contacts typically the regulatory affairs team but it can be whoever they want to reach out to for information. It's not left to the trustee or the office of the trustee to update ASIC as to amounts of remediation that are estimated? Um, in, do you mean in relation specifically to trustee matters or do you mean more broadly? No, I mean in relation to trustee matters specifically. Um, well, typically the uh, trustee, you know, has its own communication mechanisms with uh, ASIC and uh, in addition from time to time if it's appropriate, um, then uh, management can also provide those updates in, in consultation typically with the trustee. All right, we'll return to that. So you see, Mr Hagger, on this page we're looking at that there are five NAB entities that are identified as having estimates of future compensation. Yes. And four of those are financial advice licensees of NAB. Yes. And one of them is MLC nominees. Yes. Which is one of the trustees. Uh, yes, so... Um uh, MLC was, uh, sorry, MLC nominees was an AFSL uh, licensee through that um, period when the PSFs were created. And also one of the trustees. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Well, this estimate of compensation is in relation to the deduction of PSFs? Yes and that was deducted by the trustee? Yes, the, the only reason why I'm hesitating in my mind, Mr Hodge, is that uh, Newless from a particular date had become the single trustee. And then if we go back a page or two pages to page 22 to dot 5051. Yes. We see table two where NAB's the NAB group estimates in relation to compensation show that the group as a whole has paid 
three and a half million dollars or agreed to pay three and a half million dollars, that its estimated future compensation is twelve point seven million dollars and therefore its total is sixteen point two million dollars. Uh, yes, I see that. And the twelve point seven million dollars includes the eleven point seven million dollars in relation to the TERP PSF issue. Um Can I just look at this a little closer for a yes. moment, Mr Hodge? Oh, I see. So it... it it looks to me, Mr Hodge, that Table 2 yes. is a consolidation of Table 3 and Table 4. That's right. So the, your question was, does the 12.7 million include the 11.7 million? And I think the answer to that is yes. All right. And so on that basis, then, the total estimate for the NAB group is $16.2 million? Uh, yes. And you see the estimate at the bottom for all of the five groups is a total of 80 to $86 million? Yes. All right. Now, can we then bring up NAB.044.010.76 So you see at the bottom of the page is an email from Mr. Goonan to Mr. Thorburn. Uh, yes, I see that. And it's copied to some other people. Uh, yes, it is. And then you see that the email that Mr. Thorburn has received is forwarded to you and Mr. Cahill. Yes. So by this time, as I understand it, you're saying you are no longer responsible for the superannuation business. Mr Cahill is responsible for the superannuation business? Yes. And Mr Thorburn, on that Saturday afternoon, is asking if he can please discuss this with the two of you on Monday when you meet? Yes. And do you recall whether you had a meeting with Mr Thorburn on the Monday? No, I don't recall. You're not sure whether it not ended sure. up happening? All right. And the document that he is forwarding to you, if we then bring that up, is NAB.044.010.7682. And Commissioner, the attachment is already in evidence as Exhibit 5.35. You've looked at this document, Mr. Hagger, in the course of preparing to give evidence to that. Attachment. Yeah, give him the attachment. Um, as I say, very briefly, Mr. Hodge, I, I, I know you understand. I was called on Friday, and uh, these matters are some time ago. So I know you're asking me detailed questions. I'm trying my best, best, but you it can. is. Understand. And. When you say some time ago, this was, what, 20 months ago? Is that right? 22 months ago, a little under two years. Yes. You're not saying you have no recollection of any of these events? Oh, no, I'm not. Well, that's why I'm trying to answer your questions. Is I'm just trying to give you a, uh, a sense, and then I think it was probably apparent at the beginning when I described my role. Um, you know, there's a substantial amount of documents, there's a substantial amount of issues, so I'm doing my very best to uh, answer your uh, questions, but w where I don't have full or precise understanding or haven't had time to refresh my knowledge, um, I, you know, I need to say that because I think that helps. All right. Will you just tell us if there's something that 
you haven't had the opportunity to refresh your memory about and need time to think about. Thank you. So if we look at the document, we see this is what's described as the Project Rio issue summary. See at the top? Uh, yes. Do you know who prepared the document? Uh, no, I, th I think you said it was an attachment to Nathan Goonan's yes. um, email, so I assume it was prepared by Nathan Goonan, but I'd, I'd be speculating. Would you have reviewed it before it went to Mr Thorburn? I don't think so. You think it just went to Mr Thorburn without you having looked at it first? Yes. Well, I noticed I, I wasn't on the um, list. Now, you, that may be wrong, but I, that's my understanding. That's my recollection. Well... Let's have a look at some parts of it. You see the first bullet point is, ASIC has provided NAB with a redacted copy of its advisor service fees report, which it intends to issue late next week. Yes. And late next week is identified as the 26th, 27th or 28th of October. Yes. That would be the Wednesday, Thursday or Friday of the following week. Um, if, if that's what it was, Mr Hodge, I'll accept that. And you already knew that the document was expected to be issued late in the following week because Ms Debenham had emailed you and told you that? Yes. And you see it then says, we were originally expecting that ASIC would not be prepared to announce NAB's PSF issues until late November, early December, when it also announces NAB's assurance review and licence condition. Uh, yes. And is that statement consistent with what you recall you believed at the time, that is you thought that the PSF issue wouldn't be announced until later in the year? So I think there's two parts to that question. Mr Hodge, can you just repeat the question? Yes, I'll just take the second part. Do you recall that you thought at the time yes. that the PSF issue would not be announced by ASIC until later in the year? That is before you received the draft yes. report. All right. And then you see it says the redacted report indicates, and there's a series of sub bullet points. Yes. And it notes the things that you and I have already noted in the draft report in the last bullet point, which is NAB is named to have a total exposure of compensation of $16.2 million to approximately 120,000 customers. Yes. And while we can't see the other bank's compensation details, this probably means that NAB is middle of the pack. Yes. And that's based on the total expected compensation being 80 to $86 million, as we've already seen. Yes, on table, whatever it was, four. And do you recall that by the 22nd of October 2016, that is the Saturday, that you understood that based on the numbers presently contained in ASIC's report, NAB would probably be middle of the pack? Um, yes. And then you see there's another heading which is background to the PSF issue. Yes. And the third last bullet point under there is remediation has not begun for PSF as we have been attempting to resolve legal differences of opinion. Yes. The most likely remediation will be to approximately 220,000 members for approximately $34 million across TERP, SWIFT and Encompass. Yes. And the legal differences of opinion were because NAB Wealth had raised an issue as to whether or not there was an obligation on it to refund all of the amounts of the PSF? No, that's not fully accurate. Why do you think the issue had arisen? Well, the issue had arisen because um, the uh, in both a management sense, uh, a trustee sense and a legal sense, we were trying to solve three issues during that period, disclosure, entitlement and remediation. I think you were just mentioning about remediation and... Uh, wealth and I th what was going on was more multifaceted than that. I want to just make sure I understand the evidence that you're giving about this. Yes. You know that in April of 2016, so that is six months earlier, 
the trustee had approved full remediation to the TERP members? Uh, I don't remember that, Mr Hodge. Do you know that at some earlier stage the trustee had approved full remediation to TERP members? Uh, I don't remember that, Mr Hodge. At some, do you remember that at some point in time somebody raised a question as to whether or not it was necessary to make full remediation to the TERP, Encompass and SWIFT members? Yes, perhaps, perhaps it's best for me to uh, explain, because this is, uh, in terms of my role, um, I first began to be involved in about June, Mr Hodge, and that was uh, at the time that having, um, ha there having been a review in relation to TERP, the matter was then raised as to whether uh, SWIFT and Encompass had similar issues, and that's where um, we uh, approached ASIC and said, well, actually, we need to um, stand back and let a review um, be ensue looking at TERP, SWIFT and Encompass. And that then involved uh, legal work, uh, involved uh, well, a, an amount of activity within the trustee and within management in order to solve those questions about disclosure, entitlement and uh, remediation. What is the disclosure issue? Uh, the disclosure issue was getting to, well, disclosure and entitlement, those two issues were about getting to the characterisation of, um, of the fee and its entitlement um, to be in the hands of uh, MLC. <laughs> and so the disclosure, um, uh, questions that came up were firstly as it related to disclosure of the trustee to members and secondly the disclosure as it related to the um, uh, to, to, between MLC and the management team back in 2012 uh, and the um, trustee. And those issues are relevant, the issues of disclosure are relevant to the entitlement of MLC to retain the PSFs? I, ultimately, yes, they were. Are they ultimately relevant at this time to any issue other than whether or not MLC can retain the fees? Um, sorry, let me understand it again. Are they ultimately... Are the issues of disclosure... Yes. At this time, that is in 2016, Yes. relevant to any issue other than whether or not MLC can retain the PSFs? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but the, the main um, uh, part that I was involved with uh, was in relation to those three issues that I talked about, disclosure, entitlement and remediation, and with a particular view to what is the appropriate remediation in relation to TERP, SWIFT and Encompass. And? Let me show you a document. Can we bring up, this is the trustee board's resolution in April of 2016. So this is NAB.005.562.196. Give the number again, Mr. Yes, Hodge. Commissioner. NAB.005.562.1931.
Mr Hodge, if it saves time, if you're about to show me that there was a trustee resolution back in April um, that, is, that is in the records, then I'm prepared to accept that a resolution was made. I, in answering your question earlier, I didn't know whether the resolution was made or not. Yes, what I want to suggest to you is this. There is no reason why the trustee would want to do anything other than fully remediate its members. Uh, I, I don't necessarily agree, well, I don't agree with that proposition. What reason can you think of for why the trustee acting in the best interests of its members would not want to fully remediate them? Uh, well, the trustee has a duty to work through what the appropriate remediation methodology is. Otherwise, if you took what you just said to its extreme conclusion, the trustee would never take any money from, uh, accept any money from members. In this or any money it ever received, it would give back. Mr Haggart, in this case, yes. the issue was on its face quite simple, wasn't it? Let me put these things to you. It, it certainly was not simple, Mr Hodge. You didn't make it simple. No, it, Let's deal with why that no, was. No, it's not anything to do with me, Mr Hodge. It the was plan, not a simple matter. The plan service fee was a fee agreed between an employer and an advisor. Yes. Agreed? Yes for services to be provided by the advisor? Uh, well, that became part of the discussion, but yes. That was an issue that became part of the discussion when NAB Wealth raised that issue? Well, it was an issue that um, the trustee and in the period I was reviewing it, there was activity within the trustee and there was activity within uh, management on, as I say, disclosure, entitlement and remediation. When you say within the trustee on this? Yes. What do you mean by that? What is the activity of which you were aware within the trustee on this issue? Uh, the trustee was obtaining uh, legal advice. Um, the trust, the office of the trustee, and I think there's about 10 people in the office of the trustee, a, a number of those uh, trustee uh, representatives were uh, turning their uh, mind further to this and, and doing work. Um, the um, the chief risk officer of the trustee was uh, doing work in relation to this. So there was an amount of activity at the time to work through what, uh, from my perspective, and remembering my role, but from my perspective, uh, it was a complex issue. The trustee was getting legal advice and working through an issue because an issue had been raised by NAB Wealth. Uh, I, d I don't know who raised it in the first uh, instance. What I remember was that uh, TERP had been reviewed. I think you mentioned earlier, Mr Hodge, back in December 2015, there was a breach notice in relation to TERP. The matter of TERP had been worked through to a period around, well, I think you just said April for the resolution. Um, wh what I um, recall is by the time I began to get involved in uh, June, um, the um, the approach was then to look at TERP, SWIFT and Encompass to say is there anything that we can learn from the TERP matter that would help inform us as to whether we have issues on SWIFT and Encompass and secondly in relation to that investigation will it help shed any light back on the matter relating to TERP. Mr Haggard, to help you let me show you a series of documents. Can we bring up NAB.047.001.3877? <coughs> this is the original breach notification given on the 24th of December 2015 in relation to TERP. Did you review this over the course of the weekend? Uh, very, it's, I'll give you the same answer to all those uh, questions, Mr Hodge. There's some things I saw just um, very, very briefly. If we go to page four of that document, dot 3880, you see there's a section which is description of why breach is significant. I see that. And number two is the analysis to date indicates that approximately 47,000 members have been impacted by the administrator's action in implementing and administering the accounts of transferring members. 
Uh, yes, I see that. And then if we go over the page to page dot three eight eight one, you see the current high level analysis indicates that a total of approximately $4 million was deducted from the accounts of transferring members without an advisor and retained by the administrator. The fee may increase or decrease after further analysis is completed. Uh, I see that in fact, to my understanding, the figure of the number of members soon increased to um, well, I think you showed me the table, 96,000. It doubled. And the compensation improved, uh, imp uh, yes, improved to 12.7 million. And if we go That's to page dot three eight eight three, this is signed by the Chief Risk Officer. Uh, yes, I think I mentioned earlier the um, Chair of the Breach Committee. Do you agree that the trustee had not passed any resolution to approve a remediation plan at this time on the 24th of December 2015? Yes. Do you agree that there is nothing that stopped NAB at this time from making an estimate of compensation, notwithstanding that there'd been no remediation plan passed by the trustee? Well, I think there's... Um, sorry, if, if we just... Um, I was here a minute ago. Um, I think actually it's the words you're just pointing to. Actual or potential financial loss to clients of the licensee. Uh, sorry, on page NAB 047-0013-881. Yes. Um, I think the words you just read to me, the current high level analysis indicates that a total of approximately $4 million so that's the dimension uh, of, the, of the matter. Uh, in terms of compensation, at this stage, um, there's a breach being um, indicated. Uh, what happens after a breach being indicated is that then work is carried out to work out what is um, the dimensions of the issue uh, and the appropriate remediation mechanism and the compensation estimates flow from that. There was nothing, I'm sorry, I'll withdraw that. You agree that as at this date on the 24th of December 2015, the trustee had not approved any remediation plan? Uh, correct. That didn't prevent NAB from making an estimate on this date of the amount of loss? Sorry, I thought your earlier question was in relation to compensation. What, what the, happens in the breach report is that the dimension of the issue is, um, uh, is indicated so that ASIC has uh, a sense of um, the, the size involved. There was nothing that stopped NAB on this date, the 24th of December 2015, from indicating the dimension of the issue, to use your words, simply because the trustee had not yet approved a remediation plan. Oh, I see. So I'm, I think I'm understanding what you're saying. You're saying NAB is able to write here that this looks like a $4 million issue, notwithstanding that it ends up being a bigger issue than that. Is that what you mean? Mr Hagger. Yes. NAB is able to write that there is a $4 million issue at this date, notwithstanding that the trustee has not yet passed a resolution approving a remediation plan. My correct. question is as simple as that. Do you yes, agree correct. with it? Yes, right. I agree with that. And then I tender that document, Commissioner. I tender it because it's probably in, but it's a little unclear. So I tender it. So the uh, uh, breach report of 24 December 15, NAB 00556219311 uh, becomes Exhibit 5.148. I had a view, Commissioner, but it may be worth clarifying that that was the breach report issued by the Administrator, not the breach report issued by the Trustee. The report will speak for itself. But that's fine, let me make that beyond doubt. Can we bring up NAB.047.001.3884?
This is the breach report given on behalf of MLC nominees. You see that, Mr Hagger? Uh, yes, I do, Mr Hodge. MLC nominees is the trustee. Uh, yes. If we go to page dot three eight eight seven, you see under two point five, it contains the identical information from the notice given on behalf of the administrator. Uh, yes. Is there a copy of this uh, document, please? I just I tender the document, Commissioner. Breach report, MLC nominees, NAB 04700138843884, exhibit 5.149. The date of the report, Mr Hodge? Is the 24th of December 2015. And sorry, Mr Hodge, what was your question in relation to that uh, document? No, we were just helping to address your counsel's... Oh, sorry. Mr. Yeah, no. Relax. Can we, can we bring up NAB.047.002.4643? No, I'm sorry, I've read out the wrong doc ID. It should be NAB.047.006.2838. This is a letter Mr Haggis sent by NAB Wealth to ASIC on the 25th of February 2016. Uh, yes, I see that. Did you review this document in the course of preparing to give evidence? Uh, no, I don't think I did. All right, if we go to page two of that document, dot 2839. You see, this provides an update to ASIC of the number of affected members and the sum of PSFs paid by those affected members. May I just take a moment, Mr Hodge, to read this document? Yes, Mr Hagger. Thank you. Mr Haggers doing that, I'm correcting my errors about Exhibit 5.148. I gave the wrong doc ID. The system will collapse as a result, so I've tried to resolve it. Sorry, Mr. Hart, I, I think I've read most of the document, but perhaps you can um, begin, and if I need a moment more, I'll um, Thank you, Mr. test Hager. your patience. You on see that. on page two? Yes, I do. Where it identifies the number of affected members and the sum of PSFs paid by affected members? Yes. And now the number of affected members has risen to just shy of 97,000, and the sum of PSFs paid by affected members has risen to about $10.8 million. Uh, yes, I see that. And can I suggest to you that on this date, the trustee had still not passed any resolution approving a remediation plan? 
Uh, I believe that's the case, yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Letter NAB Wealth to ASIC 25 February 16, NAB 047006 Exhibit 1.150. And then can we bring up NAB.047.006.5395? And can we put that, oh no, we'll do it this first. So you see this is an email from Mr. Murphy, the Chief Risk Officer to you, Mr. Hagger. Uh, yes, I see that. This is dated the 18th of June, 2016. Yes. And is this about the time when you be begin to have an active involvement in relation to the Yes, BSS? it was around there, Mr Hodge. And Thank you. what Mr Murphy is sending to you is a copy of the quarterly update provided to ASIC for the 30 March, 2016 quarter. I... Uh, Yes. And then if we bring up the attachment to that document, which is NAB.047.006.5400. You see, this is the TERP update to ASIC. Thank you. Uh, yes, you're saying this is a uh, attachment. To yes, the, this yes. is the attachment you, Mr. Hodge. to the email that you received. Yes, and, and this is the quarterly update. That is for the quarter ending the 31st of March 2016. Yes, I noticed that. Like here, I'm not sure why it's the 30th and not the 31st, but not not relevant. And you see in the document at the top, it says approximately 97,000 members. That's the number of clients impacted. Yes. And you can see from what's contained in the breach summary that it's in relation to TERP. Yes. And then if we go over the page to page dot five four zero one. We just need to rotate that and you see it explains during the course of conducting further analysis, the administrator discovered that the number of members impacted within the scope of the event was significantly larger than the initial estimate. As a result, the number of impacted clients has increased from approximately 47,000 to 96,901. Yes. And then it says, the total incorrectly charged fees are approximately $11.7 million. Yes. And the initial estimate of the compensation amount is approximately $2.3 million and is based on a 20% loss of earnings from the total PSF deductions. Uh, yes. And that $11.7 million, you'll recall, that's the figure that then appears in the draft of the ASIC report that is received on the 20th of October 2016. Um. That, you exhibited that earlier, didn't you? Yes, you had a look at that a little earlier. Yes. Um, 11.7 million plus interest. Yes, I see that. So that seems to be where the 11.7 comes from, is this quarterly update. Um, it could be. Yes. And this, this was 30... When was this email? June. So, this is emailed to you in June, but it's yes. sending you the quarterly update that's been provided to ASIC for the quarter ending the 31st of March 2016. Yes. yes. And it's giving an estimate to ASIC of both the total amount of fees deducted and the estimate of the amount of compensation? Uh, an initial estimate, yes. And it's doing that, you can see in the next section, before the remediation plan has been presented to the trustee. Um, you see the sentence in the middle of the next box, the remediation and communications plan is being presented to the trustee board on 7 April 2016 to request approval to proceed with remediation of member accounts. I see that. So Mr Hodge, I assume what's happening here is that the this document has been prepared between the 31st of March and the 7th of April. Well, it reflects the position as at the 31st of March 2016. 
It's just because the email's sent to me on June. In June. I'm just trying to figure it out. Yes. As a, because I haven't seen this before, but I assume that's what's happening. Well, you have seen it before. It was emailed to you in 2016. Oh, yes, I know what you mean, but I mean, I haven't had time to refresh my memory around the document. You understand, though, that it is... What the document shows is that it is possible for NAB Wealth to both estimate the total amount of fees deducted for the PSFs and estimate the amount of compensation, notwithstanding that there has not yet been an approval by the Board of the Trustee for the remediation Well, it's, it's possible to estimate, Mr Hodges, it's always possible to estimate, but estimations can also be wrong, which I guess is evident in here because the initial estimate you showed me was uh, in the December figure was less than this and, and um, this was now saying, or this in the previous document I think was saying there were now 96,000 customers and 11.7 million of uh, fees and then the compensation was being worked through. I tender that email and its attachment, Commissioner. Email Murphy to Hagger 18 June 16 NAB 047006539 and attached tables NAB 047006540 exhibit 5.151. Now, did you know that by July of 2016, the possibility of further breaches in relation to SWIFT and Encompass had been identified within NAB? Yes, that's when I really first became involved, Mr Hodge. And can we bring up NAB.061.004.5885? So you see this is a breach paper <coughs> this were, and it's to the breach review committee. You don't sit on the breach review committee? Uh, no, I don't. You see it's dated the 11th of July 2016? Uh, yes, I do. And it says date breach was identified 6th of July 2016? Uh, yes, I see that. And if we go over to page dot five eight eight eight. Thank you. you see there's an assessment at this stage by management of the number of members affected, the total fees deducted and the initial estimate of compensation. Uh, I can, yes I can Mr Hodge, I'm wondering whether I can just read this for a moment again, is that all right Mr Hodge? Yes. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry, Mr Hodge, you were questioning me on page so 26. At the top of the page are the estimates which you can see uh, for TERP. That's apparent from the preceding page which you've looked at. Can we bring up both pages, both the page dot five eight 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 and also the page dot five eight eight seven. Ah, uh, yes, so Mr Hodge, that's uh, estimating the total financial uh, impact. That's right. So there's an estimate for TERP, that's at the top of the page, 26, and there's an estimate for SWIFT and Encompass, that's at the bottom of the page, 26? Yes. So this is an estimate by management as at the 11th of July, 2016? Yes. Okay. Of the... Um, yes. For yes, both, for everything, for TERP, SWIFT and Encompass, do you agree? Uh, yes, the, yes it, it is for SWIFT... Encompass and TERP, yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Reach paper 11 July 16, NAB 061 Exhibit 5.152. 
Now, by then, you'd already met with Mr Tanza once in relation to the PSF issue? Yes. And if we bring up ASIC.0036.0001.2898, We'll just get an unredacted copy handed to you, Mr. Hager. It looks very heavily redacted, Mr. Hodge. It is very heavily redacted. It was heavily redacted by NAB on the basis of without prejudice privilege, Commissioner. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the unredacted version has not made it into the court book, notwithstanding that, as I recall, you've already ruled on that. But in any event, Mr. Mr. Hager, you can see there's a letter dated the 22nd of July 2016 from National Wealth Management Services Limited to Mr. Tanzer. Uh, and from Newless, yes. Yes, it's at the top of the page though. The letterhead that it's on is NWMSL's letterhead. Ah, uh, yes, I can see that. I'm just um, pointing yeah, out the signatories were. Um, myself and the chair of Newless. When you go to page seven, you and Ms Smith have signed it. That's exactly right. And when you go to page four of the document, you see in subparagraph C at the top of the page, compensation methodology, where you're saying we are considering the right compensation methodology for these members. Yes. And this methodology should appropriately reflect any potential legal liability position? Yes, which we are working through at the moment, yes. And that was the issue that was being raised that we've talked about already, where the question had arisen, is it possible for NAB Wealth to retain these fees, notwithstanding that there was no linked advisor? But the, perhaps the best way to characterise it is that work was preceding Mr Hodge um, to go through those three issues that I mentioned earlier, disclosure, entitlement and remediation. Because they go to the question, is it possible for NAB Wealth to retain these fees notwithstanding that there is no linked advisor? Well, that's one of the questions. That's the only question in every case, isn't it? No, it's not the only question. What is the other question? Well, one of the questions is what, what is the characterisation of, uh, uh, of the money that has flowed to MLC? Because that affects whether it is possible for NAB Wealth to retain the fees notwithstanding that there is no linked advisor. Yes, that, that is true, Mr Hodge. The reason why I'm being specific about this, that there is interlinkage between disclosure, entitlement and remediation. And your questions keep saying it's only about remediation, but the three were being reviewed because it's important, uh, well, I can't speak for the trustee, but it's important to know the nature of the um, uh, expense that has, where the money has flowed to um, MLC. And then you see in paragraph 2.15. Yes. There's an explanation, oh, I'm sorry, in 2.14, you'll see there's a reference to Project Swift and Project Encompass. There we go. Yes. And there's an explanation that that's presently being reviewed. Yes. And in 2.15, it said, we confirm that if our final legal advice concludes similar potential breaches of financial services laws, we have resolved through our breach review committee to notify ASIC of these. Yes. Similarly, if we identify any matters that cause us to reflect on our position regarding the TERP PSF, we will raise and discuss these with ASIC. Yes, in fact, Mr Hodge, that's entirely consistent actually with what I uh, said uh, earlier, which is that we had done the review in relation to uh, TERP, uh, but then said, well, actually we need to stand back here because we had a product upgrade uh, in relation to SWIFT, we had an intrafund transfer in relation to Encompass. We should go back and see 
whether these same issues are present in Swift and Encompass. We should work through that and uh, similarly, if there's anything about that work that helps inform us about TERP, um, we should um, get to the bottom of all of that, leading to um, the uh, decisions around disclosure, entitlement and uh, compensation. Can we bring up NAB.047.003.2773? This is the breach notice given by MLC Limited, which it was the administrator. And it was given on, if you go to page seven of that document, dot two seven seven nine. It was given on the 14th of September, 2016. Sorry, the 14th of September, yes, Mr Hodge. That was the date that ASIC was notified in relation to the Encompass and SWIFT breaches? Yes, prior to that they were notified of the, um, of the matter, but um, what's happening here is uh, this is the significant breach notice. And if we go to page four of that document, dot two seven seven six. Yes. We see it identifies at the top of the page the number of member accounts affected. Yes. And then if we go to page five of the document, dot two triple seven, see next to actual or potential financial loss to clients of the licensee include number of clients affected, estimated or otherwise. It says work is currently being undertaken to determine the potential financial loss to unadvised members who were charged the PSF and which was retained by the administrator. Yes. Now, we've seen though already that two months earlier, an estimate had already been made for SWIFT and Encompass members. Yes. But that wasn't revealed in this breach notification. Well, I think what you showed me before was uh, a breach paper around the event and that paper, I, I don't know, uh, this paper was July 2016, so I don't know what other documents, essential documents are relevant, Mr Hodge, between what happened here and, um, and the page you just showed me in September 2016. Do you know why ASIC had not been told what the estimate was of even the amount of fees that had been deducted from SWIFT and Encompass members for unadvised members? Uh, I, I don't know whether ASIC had been told or not, Mr we, Hodge. Now, you know they hadn't been told because when it comes to the ASIC draft report, it doesn't have the figures for SWIFT and Encompass members. Um, well, I, I don't think that that's a whole different trail, Mr Hodge, but the, um, the what ASIC knew was we were looking at SWIFT and uh, Encompass. Um, in fact, by after this date, but between this date and the draft uh, report, um, I had given an indication to Mr Tanza of the, um, uh, of the dimensions of SWIFT and Encompass in um, uh, roundabout terms. When do you say you did that, Mr Haggart? Uh, I think it was in September, but after this report, I had a number of conversations, Mr Hodge, with Mr Tanza, uh, right through between June and, um, well, until his final day on 30th of November. And uh, in one of those conversations, I think it was um, towards the end of September, but uh, I'm not, in, not sure exactly which time, but I remember saying to him, um, you have the number of members and the approximate um, dollars involved in terms of the fees uh, is similar, perhaps slightly bigger per uh, member than the TERP issue. 
do you think, is this the evidence you're giving to the commissioner, that you had already told Mr Tanza that before ASIC did its draft report? Yes. And you say, nevertheless, you had some real concern come October with being specific about what the amount was? No, I'm not saying that. Why, if you had already told Mr Tanza, in, to use your words, a roundabout way, what the amount was, did you not have NAB confirm what the figure was when it received the draft report on the 21st of October 2016? Oh, I see. So, Mr Hodge, what I did was uh, when... There's sort of three phases to this. The first one was quite separately and in, in my uh, dealings with Mr Kell, I was aware that the, um, the advice service fees report was uh, being produced. Then uh, we were advised, I wasn't advised directly, but it was I think through the trail that you just showed me from Ms Debenham that ASIC was intending to include TERP. And so uh, we decided it was appropriate, and I felt it appropriate uh, as, as a um, courtesy to ring Mr Tanza, which I did, um, and to tell him actually after uh, quite an amount of work over quite a few months, uh, with ASIC really waiting for us to work our way through it, um, and they were being patient about that, we were um, nearing finalisation. And uh, therefore, um, whereas the Swift and Encompass work had been uh, something that ASIC knew a lot less about than TERP, um, if he wanted to include it in the report, he could. Now, is this the conversation you had with him on the 24th of October 2016? Uh, the latter one is. The earlier uh, one that I've referred to where I gave him, I said to him, um, as, a, you know, as a guide, the dollar amounts involved are, um, uh, are uh, slightly at or, or a bit higher than the TERP matter. That was uh, the previous conversation or one of the previous conversations, we had several. The conversation that you've just given evidence about, which is one where you told him if they wanted to include Encompass and Swift in the report, they could. Is that the conversation that occurred on the 24th of October 2016? Uh, it was around about that date. I, I have a file note. Um, which perhaps we could go to, Mr Hodge. Yes, let's go to your file note. Can we bring up nab.047.001.1728? This is the file note you're talking about? Uh, yes, it is. And did you send this as soon as you'd finished the conversation with Mr Tanza? Uh, pretty much, yes. All right. So you, you had the conversation with him, Thank you. typed this out, and then sent it off to Ms Debenham, Mr Miller, Mr Daly, Mr Carter, Mr Murphy, Mr Cahill, Ms Binney, and Mr Gall. Is that right? Yes. All right. So it must have then been a conversation that occurred on the morning of the 24th of October 2016. Yes, it was, it was very fresh. My, uh, I, I checked over the weekend uh, and I uh, saw in my diary that the conversation was set for 10.30, so this was very uh, fresh in my mind when I wrote this uh, note. The, the note may not include everything we talked about, but, um, but it was very fresh when I summarised the key points. All right. And you remember the conversation now? Uh, I don't remember all the everything about it, but I uh, I remember that we um, well I remember these uh, matters uh, here. I, I don't remember everything about the conversation. All right, but you remember what's set out here. Yes. 
And you say you told him that if he wanted to include Swift and Encompass in the report, he could. Yes. And is that recorded somewhere in the file note? Um, let me just look at the file note for a moment, Mr Hodge. Uh, yes, here in um, about a third of the way down. Um, if the report was coming out later in, say, a week or two, this could potentially be included, though I don't want to front run those board discussions. Oh, I see. What you told him was if they were to delay the report, then it might be that you would have a final position on the PSFs. Well, what I was saying was if... That we had been given a range of dates that they may bring out the report. Sometimes that happens, Mr Hodge. ASIC will say, we bring out a report on such and such a date. Sometimes it does occur around that time. Sometimes it occurs uh, later on. Um, and so I was saying to him, actually the whole, the whole background to this, Mr Hodge, was that I was giving him a proactive courtesy call and saying to him, we know you've got this report going out. We didn't know you were going to cover... Um, uh, PSF matters. It was really in an ASF report in its uh, initial construct. Um, but if you're going to do that, I can advise that we are very close to a resolution. I don't want to front run the uh, and preempt the board uh, discussions. Um, but if you want to know, and that's probably the key point here, if, if, if you want to know anything further about any of us, any of this, let me know. That was the kind of relationship that uh, an interaction, a constructive relationship uh, with Mr Tanz and, and Mr Kell for that matter on other matters. Mr. An Hodge. open and transparent one. Yes. To use the word you've used here. Yes, because uh, if um, I, I thought that if they issue the report and then the following Monday we say, you know how we've been working on those PSF matters, we've now resolved them, they might say, well, I wish you told us that last week that you were resolving them. So um, that was the main uh, purpose of the, uh, uh, the contact that I had. And so we see in that second paragraph, you say that what you'd said to Mr Tanza was, in the interests of openness and transparency, we wanted to let him know we are nearing completion of our position on PSFs. Yes. yes. With board meetings occurring this week, for NWMSL and Neulis. Yes. And that then you said to him, if the report was coming out later in say a week or two, this could potentially be included, though you didn't want to front run those board discussions. Yes, I felt that appropriate, Mr Hodge, not to preempt what the trustee um, board, it's an independent board, what, what may happen there. And you said the trustee may, for example, ask for further work or clarifications that would extend timeframes. Yes. Did you have some particular work or clarifications in mind when you said that? Uh, no, I just didn't want to preempt what the trustee board might do. And you then said to him, the main point is that we are making progress and nearing finalisation. Yes. And if he wanted to know anything further, then he could ask you about it. That's right. It was a very open door. Mr Hodge was saying, well, I don't think I could be any more open if he wanted to know anything further about any of this. Please let me know. And then in the fourth dash point, I noted that by six months' time, we will have well and truly disclosed our PSF matters. Yes, well and truly. Indeed, I said we may be in a position within the next few weeks to see the assurance review and PSF outcomes reported publicly by ASIC and ourselves, whether together or separately. We will be back in touch with ASIC accordingly. Yes, and there was a little hint in that. I said I didn't want to preempt the trustee um, decision. Um, There's a little hint to him that the fact we might be all able to uh, announce remediation probably gave him the, the hint that the... Um, uh, that, that a full compensation approach would be forthcoming. And why do you say to the Commissioner that you didn't say our estimate is more than $33 million in compensation that we will have to pay? 
Well, f firstly, I can't remember whether I did or I didn't, Mr Hodge. That's the well, first. Well, you didn't write that down, did you, Mr Hager? No, but I, you asked me why didn't I say it. I can't remember whether I did or not. Um, I, that would be a pretty important piece of information to record, wouldn't it, Mr Hager? Well, from my perspective, I had... Um, uh, well, when you say it's important, I said to him if he wants to know anything further of any of this. So if he said to me, what do you think the dollars involved are, I would have referred him to our earlier uh, conversation, which is that they had the number of members and um, I'd given him an indication of approximately what the um, dollar figure was. So, you know, as an accountant, I could have multiplied those two uh, together. He was obviously capable of doing that. Now, NAB had... We'll come back to that in a moment. Mm. NAB had already sent written updates for the report on the evening of the 21st of October 2016. Yes. And they'd updated the figure for the TERP PSF. Uh, yes, I believe so. They'd updated it from $11.7 million to $12.4 million. Um, perhaps you can show me, but yet, yes. They you I know, know that I they'd understand. updated the estimate. Sorry? You know that they'd updated the estimate yes. for TERP. Yes. Do you say that there was some reason why they couldn't update the estimate to include SWIFT and Encompass? Yes, well, I think from ASIC's viewpoint, TERP was a matter they knew a lot about. Um, then, in relation to SWIFT and Encompass, they knew that a very extensive review was going on involving the trustee, uh, involving management, uh, and involving uh, legal uh, representations as well. So, uh, for them, it was a bit different to uh, for TERP, they, they hadn't been fully uh, briefed on SWIFT and Encompass beyond the uh, breach review uh, notice. So it, in, the report was a point in time uh, report. In fact, these reports, I think this particular report's been done every six months since. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I know one came out even in the course of this round, Mr Hodge. So. Um, <coughs> Uh, so it, it, it was a uh, so in relation to the this matter, um, I was inviting him if he wanted to know more, but I knew he was coming off a much lower base. But the invitation was there; the door was open, Mr. Hodge. You're saying really it was up to ASIC whether they wanted to ask you what's the amount of compensation. Well, I don't know whether I mentioned it in the conversation or or not, Mr. Hodge. But if he wanted to know it. If he'd asked me in the conversation, I'd tell him he already had the, um, you know, the numbers from the previous conversation about the number of members and a, a rough guide to what the dollars were. And finally, um, I said to him, if you want to know anything further about it, actually, he, what, what I don't know when I have these high-level conversations also is what's been discussed at a, a working level. So he said to me he'll let his team know uh, about the call and if he needs further information, he'd let me know. You knew that if they knew the amount of compensation and updated it, that NAB's position in the ranking of entities would likely rise? Sorry, can you repeat the question? You knew that if you told ASIC that the amount of compensation that the e you estimated was $33.7 million, oh, I see what that NAB would no longer be just well, one in the middle of the pack. Uh, well, there's an assumption in your question saying if I knew, if they knew. Um, I think I've been clear that I've had a conversation with him before and I um, opened the door for him to ask. So I. Um, I don't know what further to say, Mr Hodge. You knew if the report was issued and said... I'm sorry, I withdraw that. You believed that if the report was issued and the amount of compensation estimated for TERP, SWIFT and Encompass <gasps> yes. was to rise up to over $30 million, yes. that NAB would no longer be viewed as just one in the pack. Yes, but I wasn't concerned about that, Mr Hodge. It, it was... Um, what I was doing in this conversation was putting in Mr Tanz's hands the ability to include it or not. When you say you weren't concerned about it... Yes. ..you've seen the Project Rio document that we already have looked at? Uh, yes, we can go back to that, if you like, Mr Hodge. And the issue 
the central issue that is raised at the conclusion of that document is that if the report goes out with the num figures as they are, then NAB will be one in, in the middle of the pack. But if the report is adjusted to include NAB's expanded PSF matters, expanded PSF numbers, NAB will be the worst of the banks in the report. Well, Mr Hodge, that, that was a document not prepared by me, but then, and it came to me, I think you showed me a bit earlier that it came to me, and then on the Saturday, um, I chaired a call and I had the support of uh, Mr Carhill and, uh, and Mr Thorburn to work my way through what the approach should be, and uh, what we decided, and I decided, was we should call and I should call either Mr Tanza or Mr Kell on the Monday and open the door. And that then put it out of our hands, whether it should be included or not, because the invitation was there for ASIC to include it if they wanted to include it and not include it if they felt, well, that can wait till the next report. What you could have done was to put in writing to ASIC what the total amount of estimated compensation for all of the PSF events yes, yes, was. Yes, I could have done that. And there was a decision made not to do that. Well, I don't think that... I don't think there's a decision made not to do that. The decision... There was a positive decision made. Mr Hodge, this is a positive, proactive communication to ASIC. It's actually the sort of thing that ASIC wants in a constructive relationship, saying, we know you've got this report going out. We're actually near finalisation on this matter the door is open, it can wait till the next report, but that's your call. Mr Hagger, let's look at another document, which is the one I think you've been referring to, which is NAB.044.010.7685. The file note commissioner is already in evidence. Yes. So this is an email that you send on the late afternoon of the 22nd of October to Mr Cahill and copied to Mr Thorburn. Oh, sorry, it's here. You see that? Yes, that's right. That's what I was referring to. And. You see at the bottom of the chain of emails, Mr Thorburn writes and says, can we please discuss Monday when we meet? Uh, yes, I see that. And then you see the next email in time is from Mr Cahill saying, we are waiting for Andrew H to consider over the weekend and make a recommendation. Yes, I see that. And then you see at the top of the page, you are emailing Mr Cahill and Mr Thorburn saying, yes, that's still our plan, referring to the original recommendation, which is if we go over the page to dot 7686. You see Mr Goonan is explaining that the present thinking is, at this stage, having seen the report, our thinking is to be reactive from a communication perspective, given as drafted, NAB is seen as just one in the pack, rather than called out as an outlier. Yes, I see that. So that what Mr Goonan is saying is, the plan is to remain in the middle of the pack and not be called out as an outlier. Uh, well... Uh, Mr Goonan's saying um, our thinking is to be reactive from a communication perspective given. So that's, so my, th there's two things here. One is what is NAB's communication publicly? And secondly, what is NAB's communication with ASIC? And so the decision that I, that I mentioned through the call on Friday was uh, we'll be reactive on communication about the report itself, but we'll be proactive in contacting Mr uh, Tanza or Mr Kell, and it ended up being Mr Tanza. We thought that more appropriate was his area, um, which I did on Monday morning. The premise of being reactive in the media is that 
NAB will be seen as just one in the pack rather than called out as an outlier in the report. Yes, I, I see Mr Goonan is saying that, but that's, that doesn't drive um, the decision of what to do with ASIC. In fact, it's clear, uh, Mr, Mr Hodge, that we decided and I decided to call Mr Tanza or Mr Kell and ended up being Mr Tanza. And I'm glad we did that. It was a proactive communication that was open and transparent. If you had told ASIC that the amount is $33.7 million, then you believe that that would mean that you would be called out as an outlier rather than in the middle of the pack? Uh, well, there's a couple of parts to that. Firstly, in my mind, I knew the conversations that I'd had with Mr Tanza before, so I knew he knew the broad uh, dimensions. And uh, then, uh, secondly, I was opening the door to him. I was the, the key was not with us. The key was with him to decide what he wanted to ask about and what he would put in the report. So it was a, as I mentioned, Mr. Hodge, it's, it's part of constructive dialogue with uh, with ASIC, and I've done that on other uh, occasions as well. And uh, then it's open to them to ask questions and following up some of those sorts of calls that I have uh, on other occasions and other matters, they do call or their working team calls um, you know, within hours and information is uh, provided. Um, what, what um, well, I, I don't think I can be clearer than that actually, so. You agree that NAB could provide a written update confirming the facts in the report? I said that NAB could uh, have, uh, could, it could have done anything, yeah, it could have done that. And it did provide an update, but only to update the number up to the final figure that appears in the report, not to include the Encompass and SWIFT remediation? That's right. Well, the regulatory affairs team was handling with ASIC the matters that were in the report and the SWIFT and Encompass matters I was handling separately in my conversation with Mr Tanzan. Do you say you had thought that regulatory affairs would email ASIC and include the SWIFT and Encompass numbers? No, I'm not saying that. You knew they weren't going to do that? Well, I didn't know whether they did or not, but they knew that I was handling the SWIFT and Encompass uh, matter with Mr Tanzan. If they had done that, then the... Sorry, if they had updated it to include the SWIFT and Encompass numbers, mm -hmm. then NAB, you believed, would become an outlier rather than in the middle of the pack. Well, again, there's, there's a number of parts to your question. So, Mr Hodge, let's, let's maybe break it down. Firstly, if um, ASIC had decided to include the SWIFT and Encompass matters and they uh, put the numbers in, then I believed that the NAB number would go up, obviously, and um, we, may longer be, we may no longer be in the middle uh, of the pack. Um, I knew that. Uh, in relation to, I, I didn't know, um, I wasn't involved in the um, toings and froings between the regulatory affairs team and the um, uh, and the, the working team inside ASIC that was putting together the report. Uh, what my role was was to make a high-level uh, communication with the ASIC commissioner handling this matter to say we were nearing finalisation, we know you've got this report coming out, we're an open door, um, please if you want to know more information, otherwise we know it's a point in time report, um, anything not in this report will be in the next six months will be well and truly done by then, but that's your choice Mr Tanza, that's, that's the substance of the conversation. Your responsibility was to determine the final strategy that would be used in dealing with ASIC and the report? Um, my responsibility, well, my responsibility via Mr Cahill and Mr Thorburn was to work through a few things, being the communication with ASIC and my decision and our decision was to ring Mr Tanza and Mr Kell and secondly, the what would ultimately flow from um, a media response once the report was issued, whenever that was. And on the first one, I was very involved. On the second one, 
Uh, Sorry, is the second one the media response? Yes. Okay, go on. So the second one is sort of a dynamic, pretty much everything about media is dynamic, Mr Hodge. So uh, that was working its way through with us not knowing what, you know, twists and turns media might take the following week. We were conscious that we were having full year results um, on that Thursday. Um, as it happened, ASIC elected to lodge the report on the same day as the uh, NAB results. Um, so obviously that's a time where media is quite uh, involved in, you know, it's a time that um, NAB's in the media when we do our full year results. And so that was all being factored in and worked through through that following week. I, I wasn't involved in that part of it. The media strategy to be reactive depended yes. upon the first issue, which was what you were going to communicate well, to Well, it depend, depended on that and other things, Mr Hodge. And you understood, I want to put this to you squarely, yes. that regulatory affairs was not going to tell ASIC about the amount of money that was estimated for Encompass and SWIFT. Well, I didn't, I wasn't involved in that, uh, Mr Hodge, but the understanding that uh, if we go back to who was on the call on the Saturday, uh, which included Andrea Debenham from Regulatory Affairs, then she knew that I was calling uh, Mr Tanza and um, I reported back to her afterwards and, and the others about my conversation with him. And so the ball was in his court very, very squarely from my conversation, Mr Hodge. Let's go back to page dot seven six eight five. Yes. You see, you say you ran a call for an hour with Mr Carter, Mr Owens, Mr Murphy, Mr Daly and Ms Debenham? Yes. Mr Carter reports to you? Uh, no. At the time, who did no. he report to? To Mr Cahill? He reported to Mr Cahill. By then when the change had been made? Yes. I see. <coughs> Mr Owens is in corporate affairs? Yes, so he also reports through to Mr Cahill via Mr Goonan. Mr Murphy is the Chief Risk Officer? Correct, so he reports through to Mr Gall as Chief Risk Officer of NAB. Mr Daly was whom? He reports to me. He was, he's my effectively Chief of Staff, my Executive Manager. Ms Debenham was in Regulatory Affairs? Yes, so she reported through a, di a different line but ultimately to Mr Gall. You were the most senior person on this call? Yes. Ultimately, it was going to be your call as to what strategy was embarked upon? Uh, yes, but I, what I'm distinguishing for you, Mr Hodge, and sorry for being pedantic, I know it can sometimes seem complicated, but... Um, it doesn't seem complicated. It seems very simple, Mr Hagger. You no. made a decision that you were not going to tell ASIC about the amount of compensation... No, that's not true, Mr Hodge. Well, if, if that's your simple question, no. You deny that? I deny that. And then you see in the second paragraph, the additional nuance is that we think I should call Greg Tanza or Peter Kell on Monday morning to advise the latest as to where we are up to on the PSFs. Yes. All in the ongoing interests of openness and transparency. Yes, that was the intent. We doubt they will wish to shoehorn the matter into their report given deadlines, their multi-phased approach and the very substantial rewrite which will be required to their report overall. That's right. That was my feeling. I, th I thought they... There were still things about the PSFs they needed to um, be uh, educated about uh, because they had um, been patient with us while the review was going on and as the reviews were finishing and the uh, board um, activities were, were occurring, then, you know, obviously um, uh, after that there would be engagement with, uh, with ASIC. So, I thought they're probably unlikely to put it in the report, but we should give them the opportunity. It's their report um, and whatever they need to know, the door was open, Mr Hodge. And so what do you say to the Commissioner? You were planning to tell Mr Tanza when you, had, when you sent this email to Mr Thorburn and Mr Cahill on the evening of the 22nd of October 2016. 
Yes, well, I know in your question you're, you're making a lot of the dollar figure, but this conversation was really about, well, we're almost there on PSFs. So this, the resolutions uh, of the board members are very close. And so we should let ASIC know that because in my previous uh, conversations with Mr Tanza, I had said to him, these matters are very complex, which is true. We are taking the time to get to the bottom of it, which we did, and um, that will take uh, a bit of time. So uh, given that we were nearing the end of all of that, I felt it appropriate to uh, tell Mr Tanza or Mr Kell, as I say, it ended up being Mr Tanza, that that's where we were up to, and that was being entirely open and transparent to that document, Commissioner. Uh, email uh, Hager to Carlin Thorburn, 22 October 16, NAB 04401076685, Exhibit 1.153. And then can we bring up NAB.047.001.3664? So this is the response from Mr Cahill that evening? Yes. And he says, as we discussed on Friday, I trust your judgment on this one. I think the Chief is probably keen to discuss on Monday to ensure Thursday goes as smoothly as possible. Yes. And the Chief is a reference to Mr Thorburn? Uh, I assume so. And Thursday is the day that NAB is going to release its full year financial results? Yes. And again, can I suggest a matter of concern was that ASIC would publish its report with the updated figures, which would call out NAB as an outlier in advance or at the same time as the release of the full year results. Uh, well, it was, um, when you say it's a matter of uh, concern, it's uh, our full year results uh, process, Mr Hodge involves uh, well, quite a few things. We issue ASX releases in the morning. We have investors and uh, analysts in, uh, and, and, and we make presentations with them. There's discussions with media and so forth. Now, that's all in the context of the NAB group result. So sometimes an issue of the day will come up, uh, and this was potentially an issue of the day, depending on when the um, report was going to be coming out. We didn't know, um, well, I'm not sure on what date we knew when the report was coming out, but we knew it was planned for Wednesday to Friday that week. I think that was the figures you showed me earlier. Uh, and so, um, that's, so that, that's what we were working our way uh, through. But I, I don't wanna sort of amplify the word concern to be bigger than um, you know than it needs to be. It's it's contextual in terms of it would be a, a matter that the whole report, if it came out on the Thursday, would be a matter that, regardless of where we were in it, would be potentially something that was discussed as it was released by with questions from investors or analysts or um, media or anyone else. Attend to that document, Commissioner. You may I ask uh, concerning ASIC. Uh slash wealth, Carlin Hager, 22 October 16, NAB 047-001-3664, Exhibit 5.154. Can we bring up NAB.044.010.7691? Commissioner, could I just indicate, I'd seek your indulgence if this is convenient to keep sitting for about 10 minutes so that I can finish off this topic, if that's yes. convenient. Thank you. Yes. I'm just touch that's fine, but can't please just have some more water if that's not asking too much? Yes. We'll make some arrangements. Yes, go on, Mr Hodge. Oh, sorry, thank you. Sorry, Mr Hodge, it was easily reached, sorry. And then you see there's a response from Mr Thorburn on the following morning, Sunday at 9 a.m. Yes. And he says he's sure you're working through it and will be all over the details. 
Thank you. Yes. And the main thing that he is concerned about is the proposed media response. Yes. And do you remember, I think you answered this before, but do you remember whether you ended up discussing with Mr Thorburn what the proposed media response was? No, I actually don't remember that. I tender that document, Commissioner. Email Thorburn to Hagger 23 October 16 NAB 0440107691 Exhibit 5.155. And then if we go back to your email, your file note, which is NAB.047.001.1728. Oh, yes, I have that here. Thank you. Can I suggest, on its face, it would suggest that what you are doing when you speak with Mr Tanza is giving him the impression that things are still up in the air and you'll just have to wait and see what the board's resolved to do. Uh, the way I'd characterise is a little different to that. Uh, what I'm saying to him is that um, we're nearing completion. The board meetings are happening um, this very week um, and that it could potentially be included, but I didn't want to preempt the board discussions. Well, it appears that you record yourself as having said to him that there are board meetings that are going to occur this week. Yes. For Services Limited and for Newless. Yes. That is, the board meetings have not yet occurred. Uh, well, actually, the NWMSL board meeting was on at the time. I stepped out of the board meeting. It was still live, but I, I stepped out of the board meeting when I called him. Yes, but you didn't tell him that, did you? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've said to him it's occurring this week. Um, I don't know whether when I started the call, whether I said... Um, uh, you know, I've just stepped out of the board meeting... Um, the way I've written it here could be the way that I said it word for word. And what you've written down is that you said, I don't want to front run those board discussions. Yes. Referring to the board discussions of National Wealth Management and Newless. Uh, yes, referring to both, yes. The board discussion of National Wealth Management had already occurred by the time you made your phone call, hadn't it? Yes. A couple of hours earlier, National Wealth Management had already resolved to approve the full remediation. Yes, but the board meeting was still live. It had already resolved to approve yes. full remediation. Yes. And you didn't tell Mr Tanza that? Uh, no, I don't think I did tell him that. And it had resolved to indemnify Newless? Yes. For the full amount to be repaid? Yes. And you didn't seriously think that Newless was going to decide to compensate its members to a lesser extent than full remediation? Well, I just didn't want to preempt the trustee board discussion. As I say, it, um, the trustee had to decide the characterisation of the expense and the uh, disclosure issue and the compensation. Do you seriously want the Commissioner to believe that you thought that it was possible that the trustee board might opt for less remunerate, less remediation than what had been approved by NWMSL and that NWMSL had agreed to indemnify the trustee for? Well, what I want the Commissioner to, uh, uh, to, to hear from, uh, from me as my evidence is I didn't want to preempt the board discussion. The, the board discussion had not yet uh, occurred and as I mentioned in the next sentence, the trustee may, for example, ask for further work or clarification that would extend timeframes. And that was possible. In my experience, sometimes that occurs. So I didn't feel it appropriate for me to get ahead of the trustee board. The trustee was making its decisions. What I felt it was appropriate for me to do, Mr Hodge, was to open the door uh, as widely as I did, which is very wide, to ASIC saying if he wanted to know anything further about it, if he wanted to know, like I, I didn't want to preempt the trustee board, but he can. He could have, for example, said to you, 
have you just stepped out of a board meeting where national wealth management has already resolved for full remediation? Well, he, and then you would have said yes. Yes. If he directly asked you the question, then you would have been open and transparent with him about the situation. Uh, well, I was happy, open and transparent overall. The whole construct of the call, Mr Hodge, was to be open and transparent, and I believe I was. By telling him we're waiting on the boards to resolve these things, when in fact you knew the National Wealth Management had already resolved on it. Well, what I was saying to him was that uh, board meetings were occurring this week, which is true, for NWMSL and Newless, and I said we may be ready um, to be in a position to announce this with ASIC uh, within the next few weeks. I want to be absolutely clear on this. You regard the way that you dealt with ASIC as being open and transparent. Yes, I do. I think that um, uh, at a commissioner level, um, it was appropriate to ring the commissioner and uh, advise him of where we were up to because without that call... Well, that's rather different from what you earlier described. What you said was uh, we decided we should call uh, Tanza or Kel, open the door, yes, and that then put it out of our hands. Yes. Is that the position? Yes, it was yes. their um, ability at that moment, Commissioner, to decide do we want this matter in our report or don't we? Yes, that passage of the evidence is at page 4762, lines 18 to 30, I think. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, just so we can make sure we've seen the relevant documents, can you then bring up... Can we bring up... NAB.005.893.0001. So you see, this is a chain of emails between Ms. Debenham from NAB, who is the Head of Regulatory Affairs, and ASIC. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes. And if you look in the email starting in the bottom half of the page, you'll see Ms Bird of ASIC has sent an email on the evening of the 24th of October. Yes. And she says, in relation to some comments that NAB have made, given all institutions have now provided us with updated estimates, we propose to give current estimate figures in tables two and four. For NAB, we will use the figures in your seven October monthly update. If you have an October estimate for the MLC nominee's proprietary limited compensation, we will include it. Otherwise, we will use the $108,867 and $12.4 million figure? Yes. And so that is, as we understand it, the amount paid and the amount estimated? For TERP, yes. <coughs> and the response from Ms Debenham is, thank you, please use the 108867 and $12.4 million figure? Yes, I see that. And that is consistent with the plan that you had approved on the Saturday evening, which was to not put in writing the full $33.7 no. million dollar figure? No. So this conduct of Ms Debenham is inconsistent with what you wanted to occur? Um, well, I, w I wasn't on this uh, trial and um, Ms Debenham, I, I haven't, actually haven't seen this. Um, I don't think, am I copied? No. You're not copied to no. it, Mr Hager. So, sorry, your question is, did she do the right thing? Is that your...? 
She acted consistently with the plan that you had approved on the evening of the 22nd of October. Oh, I see. Well, she was uh, working with um, Joanna Bird, who's from the advice team, on these matters. And the plan was in relation to Swift and Encompass, I would discuss with Mr Tanza. Um, she could have used the, um, the other number. She wasn't under instruction from me either way. Um, but I imagine she was waiting to hear back from ASIC if they wanted to include the um, PSF matter, knowing that um, they would also need to get more details, um, not just the number, but also uh, information of how to characterise it, knowing that ASFs and PSFs are different. Now, I just do not understand that answer because you know that there is no difference between the TERP PSF, the SWIFT PSF and the Encompass PSF, don't you? Well, what was being worked through was very much that point. Were they different or not different? And that's really a lot about what the investigation was about, Mr Hodge. And they weren't different? Uh, well, ultimately the same conclusion was made on the uh, three of them in relation to non-linked uh, advisors and we reached the conclusion to compensate all the money all the, to all the members. And that conclusion had been reached at the latest the preceding week, by the 20th of October 2016. Uh, not not, not by is, the trustee, Mr Hodge. Which is when corporate affairs knows what management is going to recommend. But not, but not by the trustee, Mr Hodge. The trustee hasn't yet passed its resolution to Correct. approve the compensation plan. Correct. So are you saying that the reason that the full number wasn't given had to do with the trustee not having passed the resolution? In part, yes, that's one of the reasons. And so then when the trustee did pass the resolution on the 26th of October 2016, yes. did you then contact ASIC to say, stop, we've got the right number now? Uh, no, I didn't do that. And on the 27th of October, the report was published? Uh, yes. And NAB announced its full year results? Uh, yes, we did. And NAB was just one in the middle of the pack? Uh, yes, it was. Actually, my, my recollection, Mr Hodge, was that uh, CBA... They were open and transparent. Uh, sorry, maybe we can go back a step. Can I finish my sentence? Uh, CBA... Uh, announced on advice uh, service fees uh, $100 um, million or some, something like that. So um, the, uh, that's my recollection. I tend to that document, Commissioner. The emails to, uh, between Debenham, ASIC and others, 24 October 16, NAB 005893 001, Exhibit 5.156. Commissioner, can we just bring up NAB.047.007.5955. And there's an attachment to that. So you'll see this is an email from Ms Debenham to you and also to Mr Carter and Mr Murphy. Uh, yes, I see that. And it's sent on the morning of the 24th of October 2016? Uh, yes, I see that. And it says, please see the attached document summarising feedback to ASIC as at Friday evening? Uh, yes, thank And then you. if we bring up the attachment, which is NAB.047.007.5959. Thank you. So you'll see this is the document that NAB had provided to ASIC. And if we go over to the second page. Yes. You see item six, amendment. Yes. And the amendment is to the affected customers for MLC nominees. Yes. And otherwise there doesn't appear to be any amendment. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry there, I... there's an amendment which is to go from 11.7 to 12.4. Oh, I see, yes. And then if we go back a page. Just before you do, um, Mr Hodge, so it says there the figures included in the draft report were sourced from the March 2016 quarterly breach update. These amended figures are correct as at 31 August 2016. I think 31 August was the date being used in those tables uh, in the ASIC report. Yes. In the draft. Yes, and, and in the final. No, remember we've seen the email, we just looked at it, where ASIC emailed Ms Debenham and said, we've now received updated figures from other banks, yes. so we're going to use October figures. Do you have updated figures for us for MLC nominees? Oh, I see. I, well, I think what I was um, referring to here was that these were the figures as at 31, 2016. I was just pointing that out in context to your question. You knew what position NAB had put in writing on the evening of the 21st of October 2016 about the factual figures in the draft report? Um, yes, I think I did. I tender the document and the attachment, Commissioner. Emails Debenham to Hagger and others, 24 October 16, NAB 0470075955, together with attached table, NAB 0470075959, Exhibit 5.157. And then if we bring up NAB.124.002.0727. You see, this is an email sent from you to Mr Carter on the evening of the 28th of October 2016. Uh, yes. Where you say, Paul, what a big week it was. When, yes. how should we communicate with ASIC re-PSFs? Yes. What's the best way of going about this? Yes. And you sent that email because you knew that NAB had not fully communicated with ASIC about the PSFs? No and you knew you were now going to need to do so? No. And on the, I tender that email, Commissioner. Email Hagger to Carter, 28 October 16, NAB 124002027, Exhibit 5.158. And on the 3rd of November 2016, a presentation was given by NAB to ASIC? Yes. Did you attend that presentation? No. But you were aware of what was in the presentation? No. Were you aware? Well, I'll show the document. Can we ring up ASIC.0039.0001.6376? So this is a presentation that was provided to ASIC, produced by NAB? Yes. Have you looked at this document in the course of preparing to give evidence? Uh, over the weekend, it was one of the many that I thank you. And um, if you go to page dot six three eight two, which is page seven, yes, and you'll see this has the figures for Swift and Encompass. Yes, and what I want to suggest to you is that the first time that NAB told. ASIC that the total estimate in relation to the PSF trade up was more than $30 million was on the 3rd of November 2016 by this presentation. Um, if we just break that down, um, there were two trade ups and a product upgrade. So, in relation to TERP at that point, um, at the moment, immediately before this, um, ASIC had the TERP numbers, so the 108,867 members, which I think is the same figure as we saw a moment ago 
in the previous attachment that you showed me, Mr Hodge, of Ms Debenham's interactions with Ms Bird. So that was clearly the TERP matter, um, number of members there being consistent. And so uh, secondly, um, uh, ASIC, I, I don't know whether these figures exactly match up with the earlier breach report of September uh, 2016. Um, but I think they do. I think they're r roughly about right. Um, and, and here would be an update. And then uh, thirdly, I had mentioned to Mr Tanza, as I mentioned, um, the approximate number involved. But this is the first time that we have by then communicated with ASIC post the trustee meeting, which uh, approved the remediation program uh, and the compensation. Um, so this was the first time ASIC had all that um, together. Uh, they had a lot of the constituent parts, but they were not aware until this moment that the final decision of the trustee was to uh, approve a full compensation. Commissioner, I tender that document. Update to ASIC slide pack 3, November 16, ASIC 0039 0001 6376, exhibit 5.159. Is that a convenient time, yes. Commissioner? We come back at 2.15. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Hagger, I just want to return and finish with the issue we were dealing with before lunch. Yes, Mr Hodge. To see if we can finalise your position. You agree that by the 21st of October 2016, NAB had internally estimated that the compensation that it would need to pay for the PSFs would be approximately $34 million? Oh, yes, that was still subject to board um, approvals of NWMSL and um, by the uh, trustee board. But that was NAB's internal estimate? Um, yes, the, yes, yes. And you agree that NAB had not told ASIC this figure in writing? up until the 21st of October 2016? Yes. And you say, as I understand it, you had no problem with giving this figure to ASIC? Correct. And indeed, you say you were happy to do so? If, if they asked, yes. Well, in fact, you say you had, in a roundabout way, already intimated to Mr Tanza what this figure might be. That's right. I'd said to him that the compensation would be um, and I said to him that the, the fees involved in the Swifton and Compass were at or a little bit higher, those involved with um, the TERP matter, and the number of members was, uh, you know, approximately the same in each case, about 108,000, 110,000. And you were therefore happy for ASIC to know the figure, even though National Wealth Management Services Limited and the trustee had not yet resolved on a remediation plan? Well, if he had asked, I would have put some uh, caveats. And in fact, I did put some caveats with him that I didn't want to front run the, um, uh, and, and preempt those board discussions. So uh, with him, um, as, as you saw, I said that the door is open whatever information you want, knowing you've got a report coming out, um, please let us know. You must have been happy, though, for him to know what the figure was before the boards had met, because you say you'd already, in a roundabout way, indicated what the figure would be. Well, I think you're mixing two concepts, Mr Hodge. There's the concept of what the fees were, and then there's the concept of what the compensation was. So what I had indicated to him throughout was that the fees were a little higher in the Swifton and Compass case than in the PSF 
case. And then the comp it obviously flows from that, that if there's full compensation, then they're the numbers. Um, but also I wasn't preempting that, uh, you know, the, f the fact that the trustee was still evaluating options. And I was aware that the trustee was still evaluating options. Do you say in your earlier conversation with Mr Tanza yes. that you had only in a roundabout way intimated what the amount of the fees were? Yes, he had the... Um, so he... I mean, I had a number of conversations with with uh, Mr Tanza and Mr Hodge. Um, but in, in the one that we were talking about this morning, uh, I said that I had said to him the number of our members, um, well, they already had that, and then that the um, fee amount was uh, at or slightly higher for the Swift and Encompass matter. So um, if we just stand back for a moment, Mr Hodge, it's like saying, OK, there's TERP, there's 108,000 customers, 12, 13, 14, what, million dollars, whatever the figure is, and then Swift and Encompass, another 108,000 customers, and something slightly higher than 12, 13, 14 million is uh, what's involved. So he had, he had the customer numbers and he had the guidance that I'd given him. So um, I'm an accountant, I'm not, I'm not sure whether Mr Tanza was an accountant or not, but I think it's, you know, estimations flow from that. Now, again, if we come back to the question that I asked you, I said, do you say in your earlier conversation with Mr Tanza that you had only, in a roundabout way, intimated what the amount of the fees were? Yes, I gave him the guidance. I think I've just answered that, haven't I, Mr Hodge? What haven't I answered? You intimated that there would be full compensation. I hadn't intimated that there'd be full compensation because that was still being worked through. But by the 21st of October 2016, yes. NAB knew that the proposals being taken to both boards was that there be full compensation? Well, the proposals being taken to both boards had two options, Mr Hodge. One option was uh, for full compensation. The other option was for an opt-in uh, They approach. had a recommendation that there be full Let compensation. With respect He's not Mr. answering Hodge. my question. Um, I didn't believe... What have you got to say, Mr Thomas? All I wish to say, Commissioner, is it was my understanding that Mr Hager had yet to finish his answer. That's all I wish to say. Yes. Can Mr. you Hodge, please... Put the question again, would you? Thank you, Commissioner. By the 21st of October 2016, NAB yes. knew that the proposals being taken to both boards was that there would be full compensation. Well, the proposal... So, I'm being precise with you, Mr Hodge. The proposals being taken to both boards was that there were two options in relation to the characterisation of the matter and two options in relation to the compensation approach and that the uh, preferred view or better view from uh, NWMSL was a characterisation and f uh, of a trust expense and full compensation. So. Uh, now, that same recommendation was then being taken to the trustee um, with a letter attached, signed by me as chair of NWMSL, saying this is our view, um, now it's for your view. So on the 21st of October, I did not know with certainty, Mr Hodge, this is probably the squarely answering your question, I did not know what the resolution of the trustee would be. You knew that the recommendation that was going to be taken to the NWMSL board was for yes. full compensation? Yes. You knew that the recommendation that was going to be taken to the trustee board was for full compensation? I didn't know that the NWMSL board would approve that on the 21st of October. Mr Hagger, you are the chair of the NWMSL board? Yes. The other two members who were attending that day were Mr Carter and Mr Lawrence? Um, perhaps we can look back at the minutes, but uh, perhaps we can look back at the minutes as to who the other attendees were. Take my word for it that sure. it was Mr I'm Carter happy. and Mr Lawrence. Sure. Mr Carter had prepared a recommendation that had been approved by you. Yes. You had approved it for full compensation. Yes. 
You didn't doubt, did you, that on the 24th of October you were going to vote in favour of the recommendation that you had approved? Well, you, your question is, did I have absolutely certainty in relation to... Did I use the words absolute certainty? Well, you said I didn't doubt, and my answer is, and I'm being thorough, we have board meetings for a reason, Mr Hodge, and that is they're on certain days and we evaluate all the matters, even if there's matters that have arisen between a paper being prepared and the moment of the board meeting. And then in this matter, and, and probably the, the most important factor, is that then the trustee board was meeting, of which I'm not a part, and it's an independent board, and their job is to do their work diligently and make their decision. So it's not for me to run over that. I actually decided, and we decided on the Saturday beforehand, that what I should do is call Mr Tanzer and say, we are nearing completion. The board meetings are this week. You've got a report coming out. He and ASIC at that moment held um, all, all the, you know, the ball was in their court. And, and I had opened it. I could not have opened the door any wider, Mr Hodge. NAB had provided... Uh, you, uh, your answer is you could not have opened the door any wider. Is that right? Yes. Very well. Go on. NAB had provided previous estimates of the amount of compensation to ASIC without a remediation plan having been approved by the trustee. Um... Sorry, can you repeat the question, Mr Hodge? NAB had provided previous estimates to ASIC of the amount of compensation without a remediation plan having been approved by the Yes, trustee. you showed me those uh, documents earlier on. And NAB's best estimate of the amount of compensation on the 21st of October 2016 was, as you've already agreed, approximately $34 million. That was the best estimate subject to board approvals, yes. So can I suggest to you the absence of resolutions from the board did not prevent NAB from telling ASIC what its best estimate was? Um, well, I didn't want to um, preempt the, the trustee's decision because I'm very respectful of the trustee board. So I invited ASIC to do precisely that through the conversation with Mr Tanzer. You say you wanted to be open and transparent with ASIC? Yes. So what you could have done was insisted that regulatory affairs update ASIC in writing with the true estimate of $34 million? Well, I, I could have instructed uh, regulatory affairs to include the, um, uh, the SWIFT and Encompass uh, matters, and they could have done that without uh, me giving that instruction. But I... Um, imagine, no, actually, I, would, I won't, I'll withdraw imagining, um, I'll, I'll say what I know. Um, in my conversation with Mr Tanzer, I was very clear with him that uh, he, that, that anything he needed to know about any of this, to please let me know. And he said he would contact his team and if he needed to know more, he would get back to me. And, and question? Commissioner, that's why I'm saying the I could not have had the door any more widely open. All right, but just if we can return to my question, I appreciate there are other things that you want to say, but the question that I asked you was what you could have done was insisted that regulatory affairs update ASIC in writing with the true estimate of $34 million. And your answer to that question is yes. Uh, yes, if I had done that, I would have um, said still subject to board resolutions and also, as you can see in the discussion with Mr Tanza, an, an education process um, about the Swift and Encompass matters. And in fact, Ms Debenham had specifically asked the question to you in her email of 19 October 2016 whether she should sh reveal to ASIC the full amount of the compensation estimate for PSS. Um, perhaps can, can we just go back to that exhibit, Mr Hodge? I have it here so it won't take long, I imagine. It's the email of the 19th 
of October 2016. It is NAB.047.007.5472. Oh yes, the very first exhibit you showed me this morning, Mr Hodge. And she addresses this email to you and some others and asks for agreement and instruction on whether we intend to preemptively communicate about, and then she sets out a number of options. Uh, yes, I, I see that. So she had specifically raised the question and sought instructions. Uh, yes, she has. I, what I don't know here um, is whether the preemptive communication refers to um, ASIC or whether it refers to her working with the corporate affairs team. But perhaps I can study the document for a moment, Mr Hodge, or is that important to you? Study the document, Mr Hacker. Yes, I, the way I read um, that, she's referring to a preemptive um, communication out into like the marketplace, um, in which case we would need to be um, liaising with ASIC because if we were to decide, well, rather than have these matters turn up in an ASIC report, we want to um, tell tell our own story our own way out into the marketplace, we'd obviously have to liaise with um, with ASIC. Of, ultimately, that's not the path we went down, as you know. No. She is asking for instruction because it will influence how she engages with ASIC. Yes, that's true. So she wants to know what the plan is. Yes. And she's looking to you for that information. Uh, well, she's looking to four of us in, in that respect, um, in that email. And one of those people is Mr Owens? Yes. And Mr Owens is the Head of Corporate Affairs? Uh, he, in, in wealth he was, I think, at that time, but he's, he's one of the Corporate Affairs um, executives. And he recommended that NAB be open and transparent and reveal the approximately $34 million? Uh, yes, his recommend, well, we'd... Um, you showed me his exhibit this morning. I've got it in front of me, Mr Hodge. NAB.162.017.2128. And on the... 20th of October, he was saying, our preferred option would see NAB proactively announce all aspects, and that was assuming um, the NWMSL and the trustee will accept management's recommendation. So that was his preferred option. And one of the premises of his recommendation was that it would involve a proactive communication strategy. Uh, yes, pro proactive, sorry, proactive towards who, Mr Hodge? Well, it's what he describes as a, let's bring up the document, NAB.162.017.2128. Yes, I have it in front of me, Mr Hodge. It would be a proactive communication strategy effectively to the world. Yes. If the $34 million was going to be revealed. Well, if, if NWMSL and the trustees accept management's recommendation, 
No. Yes. He says, our recommendations are below. We realise that our preferred option could be seen as radical and not without risk, but we believe it's the best long-term strategy. See that at the top of his email? Yes. And he says, in making these recommendations, we have kept in mind these principles, the first of which is be open and transparent with our customers, people and stakeholders. Yes. The second of which is do the right thing by our customers. Yes. The third of which is maintain good working relationships with our stakeholders, particularly yes. our regulators. Yes. And then he says, in making these recommendations, we have assumed that NWMSL and the trustees will accept management's recommendation to remediate in full. Yes. And that's because he already knows, as you do, that the management recommendation is to make remediation in full. Um, yes, the, the point I was making, Mr Hodge, is that he's assuming they will accept and um, those board meetings had not yet occurred. And his preferred <coughs> approach is that NAB proactively announce all aspects of the PSF issue? Uh, yes. Including customer, num customer numbers and the total remediation amount? Yes. And that would be, or what would be involved in that is a proactive media strategy? Yes. But instead, a reactive communication strategy was decided upon? Yes. And the premise of the reactive strategy was that the ASIC report would not be revised to include the full $34 million? Sorry, can you please repeat that? Yes, you don't need to look at this document. Just sure. go from your memory. Sure. The premise yes. of the reactive strategy yes. is that the ASIC report would not be revised to include the full $34 million. Oh, I see. Well, I'm not sure. And on the 20th of October, uh, Mr Hodge, whether Mr Owens knew what ASIC was going to end up putting in their report, because it was after that, obviously, that I um, uh, arranged for the conversation with Mr Tanzer. Now, I don't. I understand you want to keep referring to the conversation with Mr. Tanzer. Is there honestly any way in which you can say that referring to the conversation with Mr. Tanzer was an answer to the question that I asked you? Um, perhaps you could repeat the question then, Mr. Hodge. On the 22nd of October 2016 was when yes. you convened the telephone conference. On the Saturday, yes. And it was agreed that you would stick with a reactive communication strategy during that telephone conference? Yes. And the premise of the reactive communication strategy was that the ASIC report would not be revised to include the full approximately $34 million oh, in the estimate of compensation? Well, it, the premise of the um, reactive strategy was to uh, include, which, you know, the, the strategy on the Saturday was added to, which was that I would have the conversation with Mr Tanza. That's why it comes squarely in answer to your question, Mr Hodge. If the ASIC report was updated to include the full $34 million in compensation, then NAB would adopt a proactive communication strategy rather than a reactive communication strategy. Well, it, so there are a few factors at that point, Mr Hodge, the, the most important of which is the trustee board meeting. Um, in the document you just showed me, the uh, board meetings are a dependency of Mr Owen's thinking. Perhaps if I ask you my question again. Sure. If the ASIC report was updated to include the full $34 million in compensation, yes. the NAB would adopt a proactive communication strategy rather than a reactive communication strategy? Uh, possibly, but the, the media strategy is dynamic. It's, it's worked out, you know, all the way through. And if ASIC said 
we're updating our report to include Swift and Encompass, that would also include some wording around the Swift and Encompass matters, and all that would be taken into account in an updated media strategy. I'm not sure I completely understand this. When you say updated to include the Swift and Encompass matters, the only yes. thing that would need to be updated is the amount of estimate estimated compensation. Well, in my... I know you don't like me referring to the conversation with Mr Tanzer, um, but in the conversation with Mr Tanzer, I made the point that the th what was happening was that the PSF matter was being blended in the report with the ASF matter, and that given that ASIC had had less visibility of the SWIFT and Encompass matter, it was important, we felt, for them to have an education process that would help them um, be accurate in their report on the matter if they wish to include it. And hence, I, uh, that is an another reason for um, having the door wide open. So this is a new reason for having the door wide open, you say? Well, I'm referring, and if you like, we can go back to the file note, but the, uh, Mr Hodge, but I'm referring to that there were various points in our conversation, including that one, and that you said all they'd have to do in the report is put a dollar figure, and we were putting to, um, well, in my conversation with Mr Tanzer, I was saying, well, you'd, you know, there, there's things, you'd, you'd need to know a few more details than you probably currently have, so... Hence, the door was wide open, Mr. Hodge. What they were asked, what ASIC had asked for, was an updated estimate of the amount of compensation that would be payable by MLC nominees. Uh, yes, that that's in Ms. Debenham's email trail that you saw uh, separately, and that had the hundred and eight thousand customers, which is the Turp matter. And Ms. Debenham provided an update to update the figure to $12.4 million yes. rather than $33.7 million. Yes, because she was updating the TERP matter, which was 108,000 customers. Now, the report does not refer to the TERP matter, does it? Um, I'm not sure whether it refers to it in that name or not. What she was updating was an estimate of the amount of compensation payable by MLC nominees. Um, well, she, she, what she was doing was updating in relation to the TERP matter. That's right. She didn't bother to include the amounts for SWIFT and Encompass. Well, in relation to SWIFT and Encompass, as I mentioned, that was being handled through my discussion with Mr Tanza and the invitation to him to um, ask any questions he needed to in order for ASIC to finalise its report. And you knew that Ms Debenham had not given a written update to include the amounts for SWIFT and Encompass? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr Hodge. Um, I, I think I was copied on that email trail uh, earlier and I'm happy to take your word for it if I was, in which case I knew. If I was not copied, then, then I didn't know. You don't seriously suggest, do you, Mr Hagger, that you thought there was some possibility that Ms Debenham had in fact in writing updated the compensation figure payable by MLC nominees to include the amounts for SWIFT and Encompass? Um, well, based on my uh, conversation, I think the team was waiting for Mr Tanza to come back, but if the working team had come back to Ms Debenham and said, we actually want to include the Swift and Encompass matters, then that would have been, you know, something that she would respond to. So if ASIC had come back and specifically asked you, what is the amount of compensation that you estimate for Swift and Encompass, then you would have told them? Um, yes, we would have had a conversation with them first about the nature um, as per my conversation with Mr Tanza, and um, we would have asked them about the timing of their report vis-a-vis -vis the board meetings. For but example, if the uh, ASIC report was coming out prior to the trustee board meeting, you know, that, that could have raised some, um, some issues. But because ASIC had only put in its report a number 
for MLC nominees and asked for any updates to that figure. Yes. It therefore wasn't necessary for NAB to include the amounts for SWIFT and Encompass. Is that your evidence? Well, I think the, the evidence is that we were talking to Joanna uh, Bird on updating the number on the TERP uh, matter, and that's, that's what we did. And you knew before you spoke to Mr Tanza at 10.30 on the Monday morning that the written update that had been given was only for the $12.4 million? Um, I said earlier, if I'm happy to, if I was copied on that email trail, then yes. And you say that you wanted to be open and transparent with ASIC. Well, I was open and transparent with ASIC. And you say that the way that you did that was by saying to Mr Tanza things that would give him the impression that the situation about SWIFT and Encompass was still uncertain? Well, uh, what I was saying to Mr Tanza, and, and really the whole reason, remembering this is, you know, at my level to his level, so this is Commissioner level of ASIC, saying we're nearing completion, we know you've got the report, if you'd like to know more then about any of this, then please let us know. So being open and transparent was accomplished by saying, ask us what you like, but we won't tell you what to ask. Um, I'm not sure about the second one, but yes, yes, Commissioner. The, um, because we were hinting to them what to ask, Commissioner, which was the board meetings are coming up. And so it's, you know, well, saying to them... Well, one of the board meetings had happened by the time you spoke to Mr Tanzer in the sense that the relevant resolution had passed. Uh, in the case, so that the remediation to members is approved by the trustee. I'm sorry, Mr Hagger, I can't have made myself plain. The board yes. of NWMSL had resolved its position by the time you spoke to Mr Tanzer? Uh, yes, it had. The, yes. the board meeting was still live, the but meeting, the resolution I understand was done. That. Yes. The board meeting of the trustee was yet to come. Yes, correct. NWMSL had agreed that uh, full compensation would be paid, is that right? That, yes, we had agreed that and was... And that NWMSL would bear the cost of it, is that right? Yes, can I be more precise though for you, Commissioner? We had agreed a letter which would go to the trustee board and that letter that. said making it is offer. open to... The, making an offer. Making an offer of full compensation yes. which NWMSL would pay. Yes. On what possible basis, what possible basis would the trustee say no, pay less? Uh, well, I didn't want to preempt the trustee board meeting, uh, Commissioner, and what was put in front of... That more than once, Mr Hacker. My question yes. was, on what possible basis would um, the trustee well, say no, pay less? Well, in the trustee board uh, papers, and in our letter to the trustee, we said there are two approaches available and there are two remediation processes av available and we believe the better view is this characterisation as a trust expense and full remediation. But it was open to, when you say what possible commissioner, I'm just pointing out there were two options in front of the trustee board and uh, I respect the trustee board, I respect its independence. And uh, so it was meeting on the Wednesday. And then, and, and meanwhile, ASIC was in a position of knowing the board meetings were happening during the week and that if they wanted to know more, um, to please let me know. In being open and transparent, yes, Mr Tanza you gave him the impression that neither board meeting had occurred? Well, I said to him, the board meetings are occurring this week. I think that's what the file note says. I don't know precisely what the exact words were. And, um, but I think that's the... I don't want to preempt the board discussions. Yes, that's in the file note. The only way that he could have understood that was that both boards were still to discuss the issue? Uh, well, uh, I don't know how he would... Um, That's how you meant him to understand it. 
that neither board no, had my, yet resolved the issue? No, my intention, actually, my main focus was on the trustee board meeting to come. You wanted to be open and transparent with him. You could have said to him, NWMSL has met this morning. Yes, I could have told him that. You could have said to him, the board has resolved to approve full remediation and to indemnify the trustee? I, I, yes, I could, or to make the offer, but yes, I could have told him that the board had resolved to make that offer. You could have told him that NAB's best estimate, as at the 24th of October 2016, of the amount of compensation that will be payable for the PSFs is approximately $34 million? I could have told him that. You told him none of those things? I, I don't know whether I told him, like, I don't know whether the file note is a full record and there are other aspects, but I, also I was, you know, as, as we've been through, Mr Hodge, uh, I was aware, he was aware of the dimensions of the matter and also I was saying to him we could be in a position to announce uh, within uh, whatever it says there the next uh, few weeks with ASIC and I mentioned to you that that uh, of itself is a hint to Mr Tanza that full compensation is uh, involved. So I think I'm kind of leading him with some good signposts, but meanwhile saying if you want to know anything about any of this, knowing that you have your report coming out, then that's your call. What you were doing was making sure he would never be able to say why didn't you contact me to tell me these things before we finalised our report? Uh, well, you're putting that as a negative. I, my view and the view we took on the Saturday was that this would be a proactive, positive communication with ASIC to open the door and tell them that actually this matter which has been going on for some months is nearing finalisation. There are, at any point in time, Mr Hodge, a number of matters in train with ASIC uh, across the bank and, and across how many all of banks. those are about to be published in a report that well, week that, by the, ASIC? That, if I can just finish, Mr Hodge. At any point in time, there will be reports on various things. And, and there are a number of ASIC reports that have a bit of a series to them. Um, so, and, and this was intended to be one of a series. So... We decided that it would be good practice to proactively ring Mr Tanza and give him the opportunity to include it, notwithstanding that ASIC hadn't done its full work on Swift and Encompass and still had more work to do. If you were honestly going to be open and transparent with ASIC, you would have told them that NAB's current and best estimate of the full amount of compensation payable in respect of the PSFs was $34 million? Uh, well, my intent with ASIC, Mr Hodge, I could have done a number of things, but my intent was opening the door to them that if they wanted to include that matter in their first report, that they were welcome to do that, and then it was in their hands. They didn't know that matter, because that matter is the $34 million. They knew that matter, Mr Hodge, because it's swift and encompass. They had been uh, aware of it for some months, perhaps many months. Um, I had a number of conversations with Mr Tanza along the way. He knew so that... They knew that it was $34 million. I said they knew the dimensions of the matter, which... Um, Please, if you would listen to some questions as I ask them and answer them. If you were being open and transparent with ASIC, you would have told them that the full amount of compensation that NAB on that day estimated that it would have to pay was $34 million. And, I, and I'm replying by saying I was being open and transparent with ASIC and that in relation to the dimensions of the number, I was aware they were aware of the dimensions of the number and I was telling them that there were board meetings going on during the week and that, you know, it was up to them when they wanted to release the report and, and the questions they wished to ask us. And so um, we, we were being open, Mr Hodge. Why do you say that you did not 
say in writing on the 24th of October 2016 to ASIC that NAB's best estimate of the amount of compensation payable with respect to the PSFs was $34 million? I think because um, from our perspective, ASIC were asking for an update figure in relation to the customer matter that was in there, which is the 108,000 customers, the TERP matter, which we gave them. And uh, secondly, in relation to the uh, Swift and Encompass matter, um, we had, um, uh, you know, I'd had my conversation with Mr Tanza. So the, in our minds, there was no cross-reference between Joanna Ball's question for an update of the matter relating to the 108,000 customers and Mr Tanza. There wasn't, in a sense, that Mr Tanza had spoken to, oh, sorry, to Miss Bird. Now let's take each of the two reasons that you've given. The first reason is because you say, as I understand it, that you believed that ASIC was only seeking an update in respect of the amount for TERP. Yes. And what is the basis of your belief for, of, for that statement? Because this was a kind of tweaking uh, exercise the way we understood it. Um, of the matters that were currently uh, listed, and I think you took me to that table uh, earlier on, and the MLC nominees matter that was uh, mentioned there uh, was um, uh, in relation to TERP. Nope, sorry, let's bring it up. NAB.158.006.5030. And can we go to page dot five zero five three? You say there's a reference to TERP there, do you, Mr. Hagger? I know what there's a reference there to an employer superannuation plan, which we took to mean TERP. I want to understand if this is seriously your evidence, that you say that internally NAB had a discussion and thought, well, this is only referring to the employer superannuation plan for TERP, and therefore ASIC is not asking us to give an update on the full amount of compensation that we expect to be payable in respect of all PSFs. Yes, that is, is my evidence. In, um, as Ms Debenham had said in her earlier note, ASIC has told us they want to include TERP. And then later on they asked for an update about it. Um, but we thought, given that we were near finalisation on the um, Swift and Encompass matters, that uh, we decided, and I decided, that we should contact Mr Tanzer or Mr Kell, as we did. And so that's the second reason why you say, why you said before, that you didn't put mm. it in writing, which is that you were contacting Mr. Tanzan. Yes, I contacted Mr. Tanzan. Now, did that in some way prevent you from putting it in writing? Uh, no. So the fact that you were contacting Mr. Tanzer can't have anything to do with why it is that you didn't say the full amount of an estimate of compensation is $34 well, it can, million. It can, Mr. Hodge, but I'm... You're asking me a couple of questions of could, could I have? Well, yes, I could have um, put uh, 34 million in writing. Uh, what I did was verbally ring Mr Tanza and say, um, this matter's nearing finalisation. All those details were wrapped up in uh, whatever he needed to um, inquire about. And really, the, he only need look at the board papers of the board meetings that I referred to in my conversation with him. So um, this, this was all a positive, constructive, open conversation, which um, I held with Mr Tanza. I want to suggest yeah. to you the reason that you didn't tell ASIC in writing that the estimate of full compensation was $34 million was for the reasons that were written down by NAB which were that doing so would mean that NAB would become an outlier rather than middle of the pack. Mm. No, I don't agree with you, Mr Hodge. Do you say that that had nothing to do with the decision? C 
Correct. NAB wrote this down. Yes. But that had nothing to do with the decision. Well, I, NAB wrote down, through corporate affairs, a plan. I then had carriage of the matter uh, through the meetings on Saturday and we decided, well, in relation to this plan, the best thing to do is to ring Mr Tanza from my level to his level as commissioner and to uh, open for him and his working team whatever they needed to know if they wanted it in this report. And actually, um, he in, uh, in the conversation did note, well, it's a point in time report. And do you say it had nothing to do with the fact that Mr Thorburn was going to be announcing the full year results on the Thursday? Yes, I do say that. And Mr Hodge, by ringing Mr Tanza, and if his team in following up said, what's the amount of compensation? Show me the board papers. Okay, the trustee meet, board meeting's happening on this day. We'll need a few days to get our report um, uh, then to be updated in various ways that we believe are consistent uh, to that. Um, then um, it was out of our control into, into his uh, as to that happening. So we had, if, if you're asking was NAB trying to control something leading up to the Thursday, quite the opposite, Mr Hodge, because I was opening the door to Mr Tanza and if he wanted to ask about those matters, uh, which um, he said he would talk to his team and come back to me, then he had, um, he had everything at his disposal. There was nothing we could control um, at that moment. It, the, the, the doorway had been given to him. Mr Hagger, it wasn't out of your control. You could have told them the number in writing. I could have told them the number in writing. I and said that. And you didn't do so. And I didn't do that. And that was because you were not being candid with ASIC. No, that's not true. And that reflects the way in which, over a number of years, you have dealt with ASIC. That's not true, Mr Hodge. And it reflects, can I suggest, or is reflected in the way in which you went about dealing with remediation of the ASFs. Um, just as we turn to that, Mr Hodge, I've... I think I've said no to your uh, propositions and actually um, when the um, planned service fees, when this matter was announced, um, ASIC um, said publicly that we had been cooperative with them. I'll go back to that with ASIC, Mr Hagger. Can Please. we bring up NAB I'm sorry, ASIC.0038.0009.4847. This is a letter, Mr. Hagger, that you received from ASIC on or about the 5th of June 2015. Uh, yes. And Thank you. you see in the second last paragraph on the first page, in order to assist ASIC's current review on charging of advice fees, we ask you, to the extent this has not already been done, to scrutinise the operation of all of the AFSS licensees that form part of the NAB group. We yes. provide personal financial advice to retail clients yes. to ascertain whether there are issues related to incorrect charging of advice fees. Uh, yes. Now, do you say that NAB has now, as ASIC requested, scrutinised the operation of all of its AFS licensees to ascertain whether there are issues related to incorrect charging of advice fees? Uh, well, we have um, uh, re reviewed the operations of the AFS licensees to various degrees and various levels since the 5th of June. 
attend to that document, Commissioner. Letter ASIC to Hagger 5, June 15, ASIC 0038 009 4847, Exhibit 5.160. We bring up NAB.156.061.8966. This is a briefing planner for a meeting to occur between NAB and ASIC on the 16th of October 2017? Yes. And one of the attendees is you? Uh, yes. Another is Ms Thank Cook, you. the Chief Legal and Commercial Counsel? Yes. Now, can I just clarify some, something about this, which is up until this point in time, you have been leading the negotiations with ASIC in relation to advisor service fees? Yes. And then in about October or November of 2017, Ms Cook takes over from you? Uh, yes, she takes over in terms of leading those discussions. We continue to work together after that for a period on, on these matters through to about May this year. But so there were three periods. There was me leading, which was effectively the period from June 2017 to uh, October or November. And then there's a second period where Ms Cook is leading, um, but I'm um, uh, working with her. And then there's a third period, which is around from about the end of May, um, where, um, where Ms Cook has been uh, solely leading. Well, you'd been leading it since about June of 2015, hadn't you? Oh, yes. Well, that's... Sorry, I'm yes. focused on Ms Cook's newer to NAB. I understand. So from about June 2015 until about October 2017, you're leading it? Yes. And then from about October 2017, Ms Cook takes over leading it, but you're still involved? Yes. And why does Ms Cook take over leading it? Because uh, well, even, from 2015 to the uh, back end of 2017, there were a number of... Uh, in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of discussions with uh, ASIC on various aspects of the advice service fees to various cohorts in various areas. And then the reason, one of the other reasons why I mentioned June was in uh, June that was um, in relation to a more holistic plan around NAB financial planning. Uh, that was the first date that I put a more holistic plan uh, to, uh, to ASIC. So when did you put a what you just oh, sorry. A holistic I, sorry, I haven't finished. Um, I haven't explained that well, Mr. Hodge. Forgive me. I'll, I'll start again. The re, you, your question was why did Ms. Cook take over? The reason why Ms. Cook took over is that uh, in the period of the previous six months when I had been leading, there were times that it seemed that ASIC was. Uh, with some exceptions, but broadly comfortable with our approach. And then it became clear in August that they were not comfortable. And then things were quiet through September and then ASIC uh, wrote quite a legal um, letter back to us that was clearly unhappy. And at that moment we felt it best, given that it had become a legal matter, that Ms Cook lead the discussions. And she's Chief Legal and Commercial uh, Counsel. And so, in a good position to um, take over the the lead of those discussions. I understand. If we go to page dot eight nine six nine of that document, yes, you see there's an appendix two, and this sets out the timeline of what has occurred in relation to advisor service fees. Yes. Have you looked at this document in the course of preparing to give evidence today? Uh, no, I haven't. Right, but you would have looked at this document at the time when you were yes, preparing I would have. for the meeting? Yes. And I just want to direct you to some items on it. So you see 5 June 2015, there's the reference to the letter we've already looked at to you, asking you to scrutinise the operation of your advice licensees. Yes. And then if we go over the page, we see 
26 November 2015 letter from ASIC confirming its expectations for the fees for no service review, including that it should cover all advice licensees for the period 2008 to 2015? Yes, I see that. And then you see 7 November 2016, meeting with ASIC to discuss the concept of offer of a review and the proposed timing for completion of the fees for no service review, ASIC indicated that they were not in agreement that the offer of a review constitutes service delivery and noted that completion of the fees for no service review by the end of 2017 is two and a half years after ASIC first asked for the work to start. Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot 8971, we see 16 December 2016, meeting with ASIC in relation to fees for no service review, discussed NAB's proposed fair exchange of value methodology. Yes. Were you involved in the development of the fair exchange of value methodology? Uh, I was aware it was uh, being put forward. I remember the background to it. I, I wasn't involved in it, removing my role. You know, I, I became involved in, in this matter uh, in the run-up to 2nd of June, which I think there is where it mentions my name. But I was aware Mr Miller uh, reported to me at that time, Mr Hodge. And what did you understand the fair exchange of value methodology to be? Well, what had happened, Mr Hodge, was that uh, ASIC had said to us, we're concerned that advisors are uh, receiving fees and may not have provided the service. That's the, and they said, but when we look at the legal documents, there's a number of legal arguments that you're putting forward. Can you put away legal approaches and can you tell us what is a good customer approach? And so, now of course NAB uh, is uh, known for back in 2010, 11, having a fair value uh, approach to a number of um, uh, products uh, within the bank uh, group. And so fair value is pr probably best known through what's called the NAB breakup uh, campaign, Mr Hodge. Um, at that time did a number of things to switch off fees and, and, and other matters. And so it was, and it, it works through from a customer's perspective, has there been a fair exchange of value? And if there's been a fair exchange of value, then that satisfies the arrangement. If there has not been a fair exchange of value, then something needs to be done about that. Now, only, I don't know the specifics of what Mr Miller put forward, but that's, that's the concept of the fair exchange of value. Can I suggest this, that the persistent position of ASIC was that if you have contracted to provide a particular service, you need to have actually provided that contracted service in order to be able to retain the fees for that service. Yes, that was ASIC's persistent approach. And that was a position with which NAB disagreed? Well, what NAB disagreed with was the, and, and this was a conversation over quite a period of time, the way to establish whether services had been provided or not. To give you an example, Mr Hodge, ASIC's view was that in order to determine whether services had been provided, NAB couldn't rely on um, customers um, uh, confirming whether the service had occurred or not. They said, actually, it's only the written evidence that you can look at. So we had discussions over some period of time, Mr Hodge, and I remember this because of my own meeting where we put a revised methodology to uh, ASIC on the 2nd of June, and we went through with them, here are the core beliefs that we have about service agreements, here's what we think is the appropriate remediation uh, methodology. So throughout, we, we were having tough conversations with ASIC, and uh, I guess you'd call it a, a tough discussion or a tough challenge or a tough negotiation, but all, all this was going on, particularly with intensity through from about May 2017 um, through to the October moment you mentioned when I, 
when when ASIC wrote its legal letter and and Ms Cook took leadership. Is the legal letter you're referring to is that the outline of contraventions? Uh, I think so. It's a I can't remember the actual name of it, but it's it's a, a letter of around October 2017. It, it might be the letter that was given to us at the meeting that this is the briefing planner for. Now, and if not, it would be soon thereafter. It's, it's not in this list. Do you say that you proposed to ASIC that you would get to retain the fees if clients confirmed that they had received the contracted services? Yes. And when do you say you did that? In uh, June 2017. I see. Can we bring up ASIC.0047.0001.0087? So this is a letter of the 5th of July 2017 from you to Ms McCauley. Yes. And can I suggest this, that one of the, as we've already agreed, one of the fundamental propositions that ASIC continued to insist upon was that if you have contracted to provide a particular service, and you have not provided that service, then you do not get to retain the fee for that service. Now that's what they're saying, yes. And you at your meeting with, and I think that was with Mr. Kell on the 2nd of June 2017, does that sound yes. right? Yes, yes. You at your meeting on the 2nd of June 2017 didn't agree with that? Uh, well, what we said, <laughs> we, we actually, uh, I don't know whether you've got the exhibit Mr Hodge if we want to go to that. What we said um, was the ongoing service program um, had, remembering we're going back to 2000 and I think by then it was 2009, um, and, and we showed them some recent data which was digital data we showed them, well, here, we, we have a digital footprint, if you like, of um, uh, records in relation to interactions with customers. And we said there's a $28 million, um, and, and the number of customers attached to that, which is like 48,000 or something like that, cohort where we don't have digital evidence of interaction. So what we want to do is to find out within that cohort what's actually happened. And remembering that we're talking about digital evidence being missing here. So what we said, Mr Hodge, was we need to uh, find more evidence here of what's actually happened. Physical evidence, discussions with advisors, discussions with uh, customers. And uh, that was uh, a key part of the basis of the 2nd of June remediation approach. Let me summarise the approach and see if you agree yes. with it. The first part of it was, if you had some digital data evidencing interactions between the advisor and the customer, then you would get to retain the ongoing service. Well, not, not all digital, because some digital data um, was, you know, of a newsletter and those kind of uh, natures. Um, but other digital data, we showed them and, and ultimately they asked more questions about it. There were statements of advice, records of advice and then other evidentiary points. And what we were talking about, at one end of the spectrum, ASIC was saying, well, you should just pay all the fees uh, back with, with a very narrow interpretation of what evidence needed to be demonstrated. And at the other end of the spectrum, we could have said, we just should retain all fees no matter what. And actually, we were putting forward a proposal, which at the beginning, 
we believed ASIC was, that there was one aspect about it that they didn't like, uh, which was fair enough, um, but the rest of it at that time, we thought they, well, we'd, we'd had f initial feedback from them that uh, we were on a reasonable track, but then it became apparent a couple of months later that they simply didn't agree with that. And remembering at the time, Mr Hodge, they were in similar discussions with a number of other institutions. And whilst we had no visibility of that, they were looking to uh, apply some similar bases and similar remediation programs across um, the, uh, the various institutions. Look, in the end, it's a matter for you and the Commissioner, Mr Hagger. I'm not going to interrupt you when you talk, but if I ask you a question and then you begin saying a whole lot of other things in order to try to justify your position that are not an answer to a question, this is going to take even longer than it is already taking. That's Do you fine. understand that? Y yes, I understand that. I'll, I'll try to be succinct. I apologise if uh, I'm not being succinct enough for you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hodge. There were, can I suggest, two categories of clients that you addressed as part of the remediation methodology that you put forward to ASIC in June of 2017. The first category was clients where you had some digital evidence of interactions between the advisor and the client. Uh, yes. And the second category was customers where you had no digital data evidencing interactions between the advisor and the client. Yes. And for the second category, what you proposed was an opt-in methodology where the customer could say and attest, I didn't receive any services. I think we had some other things in that funnel, Mr Hodge, than a pure opt-in methodology, but there were opt-in, effectively opt-in aspects to it. Well, in fact, that's true, isn't it? What you also were going to seek was an attestation from the advisor. Yes, and we're also going to review for physical records because what we... Oh, sorry, you don't want me to expand. You were going to review for physical records to see whether in the physical records you could find any evidence of interactions. Correct. Mr Hager, let me be clear. I'm happy for you to answer my questions. I'd like you oh. to answer my questions. Okay, thank you. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is answer my questions instead of giving speeches about other things to attempt to bolster your position. Oh, I'm not attempting. you understand? Mr Hodge, I understand you want me to be succinct and I will try very hard to do that uh, in relation to making speeches to bolster my position. That's not my intention at all in these proceedings. I'm here to answer your questions and assist the Commissioner. And if we go to page .0088 of that letter. Yes. You see in paragraph... I'm sorry, you see at the top of the page it says, we outline these below, which are either your range of available <coughs> services or our core beliefs. It's a bit unclear from the preceding sentence. But in any event, we outline these below, linking key aspects of the contract to our principles. Yes. And then in number two, it says, the customer understands the service relationship and is well placed to assess whether the service they receive is of, is of value in the light of the access to the full system and services we provide. Yes. And then there's a number of dot points there. Yes. But the first one is regular reviews at agreed intervals. Yes. And ASIC's position was, where you have contracted to provide a regular review at an agreed interval, that is a fundamental part of the service that you are providing. Yes. And unless you have evidence that you have provided that regular review, you should not be retaining the fee. Yes. And your response, which we see at the bottom of the page, in paragraph number two under item two is, we have a combination of evidence points to demonstrate that we have discharged our contractual obligations. This approach recognises that NAB's obligations under the ongoing service program would be discharged by a series of interactions rather than specifically a review. Yes. And that is consistent with what you have been 
explaining at length to the Commissioner, which is the fact that you contracted to provide a review did not, as far as you were concerned, mean that you needed to have provided a review in order to retain the fee? Um, no, what I'm, what I'm saying is we were developing a remediation program which we felt was uh, pragmatic and able to get to the heart of what had actually gone on between an advisor and a client. And so, uh, for example, ASIC was saying, well, an agreed interval will take that as one year. A regular review will take that as a written report. So each, so both us and ASIC were reading different things into different words. And the, the matter got further complicated, Mr Hodge, by the fact that we had nine ongoing service program contracts, each with slightly different uh, wording. So um, when we presented the... Oh, sorry, you don't want me. We go over the page to page dot zero zero eight nine. Yes. We see... In the middle of the page, a paragraph which says, further, as noted in our two June presentation, we have identified a segment amounting to approximately $28 million in revenue where there is no digital interaction in the duration of yes. the customer relationship over the period in question. Yes. And in that case, in order to retain the fees, what you were proposing was that A, you would look to see whether you could find physical evidence yes. that there had been an interaction? Yes. And if there had been physical evidence, then you would consider that you didn't need to repay the fees? Yes. And B, you would seek advisor attestations as to whether or not they had provided the services? Yes. And if they attested that they had provided the services, then you wouldn't see a reason to repay the fees? Yes, still subject to assurance, but yes. And third, if all of those hurdles failed, then you would ask the customers to attest that they had not received the services. Yes. And if they were prepared to do that, then you would be prepared to refund the fees. Actually, that, now that's not true, is it? Yeah. If they were prepared to do that and subject to a further review that you did, you were satisfied that no services had been provided, then you would be re prepared to refund the fees. That's a long se sentence, Mr Hodge. Um, perhaps... You explain it in your words, Mr Haggard. Sure, Mr Hodge. Um, the, what you're referring to, by the way, is the part of this broader remediation program which ASIC uh, didn't like and they said so quite soon and we said we can be flexible about this. The, what we were saying was for this... T we have a cohort without digital records. And of course, remembering this goes back to 2009. So there's a lot of things in boxes. Once we had gone through the, those records, we would then go to the advisor. And then if, that, if neither of those two demonstrated service with assurance, we would go to the customer. And if the customer said there has been service, um, sorry, if the customer said there hasn't been service, we would refund uh, the fees um, and but what we said which ASIC didn't like and, and we said fair enough was that if what, what we said was that if we didn't hear from customers we would assume they were happy and um, we had a fundamental belief which I still hold today that customers tend to know whether service has been provided or not. They may not know whether advice is appropriate or inappropriate, but we have a stronger belief about the role of customers and customers knowing whether they've had service or not, and we wanted to build that into our program. Well, Mr Hagger, there's this point about it. The trustee had paid out trust money, hadn't it? This is not a trust matter, Mr Hayne. This is a, in, in the advice licences realm. Now, that's not quite right, is it? The, in many of the cases, the money is deducted from oh, yes. the trust 
and paid by the trustee to the advice licensee? Uh, yes, the, these matters were in relation to NAB FP as a licence, as an advice licensee. That's what we're talking about here. Now, I agree with you, Mr Hodge, if this shortcuts it, that there are NAB FP clients who have their money in MLC super and that uh, under various arrangements, those uh, fees are deducted from funds. By the trustee. By the trustee. Yes. That is, trust money had been paid out. Is that right? For, for that cohort, Mr Haynes. In payment uh, of fees for services. Is that right? Yes. Services which it was said had not been provided. Well, that was what was under review, Commissioner, yes. It was a matter for the trustee, was it not, to determine whether the money it had paid out had been paid out properly? Yes, that is a matter for the trustee, uh, Commissioner. Uh, what ASIC was doing here was a, a separate exercise of going to the advice licensee and saying, show us that these services have been uh, provided. Yes. And then the last point of note on this page and the other matter of disagreement with ASIC was that ASIC's position was if you have agreed to provide an annual review, then you need to have provided a review each year. Uh, yes, that was there position. Uh, well, that changed over time. Um, but there, um, but, but that was their uh, position in these, well, actually in these conversations, they were saying b between the 2nd of June and this letter, 5th of, of July, we were under the impression that ASIC was broadly comfortable with our remediation program but unhappy about the matter we just, you and I just talked about, Mr Hodge. That matter being NAB didn't want to review whether it had actually provided the agreed annual review in every year. No, that matter, the, the matter they were specific on that they, at this time, that they were not happy with was that in circumstances where we had no digital data, oh, no physical the records, problem. down, yes. That was the um, bit that they said that they were unhappy about. You thought that you'd got them to come round on the issue of whether or not you'd actually provided the specific contracted services? Well, to be fair to them, they were still doing their work, but on the 7th of June, I think it was, um, I had had a conversation with Mr Kell, which I reported um, to the NAB board, the NAB board was meeting that day, which was a first reaction to our proposal. And um, so our, our understanding at this point, it changed later, Mr Hodge, but our understanding at this point was that ASIC was broadly happy with the direction we were headed, um, but unhappy about the specific item that you just raised. And I think you're talking about a specific item which is what happens where you don't have any digital data for customers. There's another issue that ultimately arises, which is NAB did not want to have to review whether or not it had provided the annual review in every year of the customer relationship. Yes. It wanted to say, we'll look at the whole of the customer relationship. Yes. Take a holistic approach, I think was the word yes. that you used before. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Briefing, uh, this is the letter, is it? Yes, Commissioner. What about the briefing planner? Is that in I'll, evidence I'll, already? It's not, but I'll tender that as well, Commissioner. Briefing planner, NAB, ASIC meeting 16, October 17, NAB 15606189, exhibit 5.161, exhibit 5.162 is letter 5 July 17, Haggart of McCauley, uh, ASIC. 0047 0001 Exhibit 5.162. Thank you, Commissioner. And then in October, you received the outline of contraventions from ASIC. Yes. yes. And that set out the remediation methodology that ASIC insisted upon? 
Uh, I can't remember whether it had all the... Perhaps we can go to that, Mr Hodge. ASIC.0036.0002.2531. And if we go to page.2544. See, this is the methodology for further reviews. Yes. So this is the methodology that ASIC insisted upon? Uh, yes. And this was in October of 2017? Yes. And ultimately, at the end of June of this year, NAB agreed to use this methodology in relation to NAB financial planning? Um. Uh, I well, it, sure. It's it's much closer. I don't know whether it's exactly the same, Mr. Hodge, but um, it's. Uh, I I do know that um, the that in June this year or July this whatever the date is that um, NAB has put forward a methodology which is uh, along the lines of um, and perhaps more expansive than what uh, ASIC has got in this document. For NAB financial planning? For NAB financial planning. Has it agreed to it for its other advice licensees? Yeah. Uh, not as yet. And the methodology that is much closer to what ASIC was proposing will fundamentally require NAB to review whether it actually provided a regular review where it contracted to provide a regular review? Yes, it, it will require, and, and we're standing up the program now, it, it will require very substantial documentary searches and and uh, such aspects. And that agreement comes three years after ASIC first wrote to you and asked you to scrutinise the operation of your advice licensees? Yes. What do you think that period of delay says about the culture of NAB wealth? Um, a few things. From a delay perspective, I'll use that word, um, we had tough discussions with ASIC along the way and uh, so from a cultural perspective it shows that there were some things that we were holding dear which ASIC did not hold dear. For example, the role of customers in the methodology. What ASIC holds dear is that if you contract to provide a service, you have to provide that service if you want the fee for it. Yes, and we, we agree with that, Mr Hodge. Now, in June of this year. Yes, but where, where most of the discussions were about, Mr Hodge, was, well, what exactly is the service promise? What is the documentary evidence? And what is the oral evidence, which is um, appropriate in the circumstances? And we had some differences with ASIC along the way, and there were some as I say, some tough discussions. Um, ultimately, uh, NAB has put forward a methodology in keeping with this. Uh, this methodology here is not something we knew back in June 2015, um, but w what we've put forward is similar and in some ways more expansive than what's here. NAB has also recently admitted to ASIC that on 84 occasions between 2014 and 2017, it failed to provide a significant breach notice within 10 business days of becoming aware of the breach? Um, Are you aware of that? I think there's a reference, I don't know the exact number, Mr Hodge, but there's a reference in here to um, breach, um, to a number of uh, breaches not reported within a 10-day period, uh, m mostly in those earlier years, but the, 
there is a number. Are you aware that 83 of the 84 breaches related to NAB Wealth's business? Um, no, I didn't know that number, but I'm not surprised uh, that that's the number. Why are you not surprised, Mr Hogan? Because wealth was the area, and I, I knew this coming in in uh, 2013 to be group executive for NAB Wealth, I knew there were a lot of things that needed to be fixed, and actually breach reporting was one of them. And uh, through a project called Project Sunrise, we invested a lot of money in improving uh, processes uh, under ASIC's uh, watch, and they saw the improvements that we made in breach reporting and actually our breach reporting data in recent times has been, you know, they, they have, has been um, good but not perfect, uh, but a substantial improvement on uh, where it was and, uh, and ASIC has uh, noted that. You know that failure to report a significant breach within 10 business days is a contravention of section 912D of the Corporations Act? Um, that's a legal question, Mr Hodge, but I know that there's a 10-day requirement. I just don't know what... You don't know if it's the Corporations Act? I don't know what the... Contra I know there's 10 days, 10 wor is it 10 working days, to um, report. Do you know that the Corporations Act requires you to report a significant breach within 10 business days? Uh, yes, I do. The point I'm making is um, I, d I don't know the sections or the... Um, of the Corporations Act, that's illegal. I'm not involved in breach, um, the, the breach review committee in, in its workings. Does NAB regard breaches of the Corporations Act as serious? Yes. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Thomas. No re-examination, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Haggard, you may step down. Um, Commissioner, would Mr. Haggard please be excused from further attendance? There is reason not to, Mr. Hodge. No, Commissioner, no reason not to. You're excused for further attendance, Mr. Haggard. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Pinto from Suncorp. Could we. Want, uh, if, I, if I come back at quarter two to Thank allow you, Council to arrange their uh, papers at the table? Thank you. Yes, quarter two. Four.